Okay, three, two, one. Hello world, happy Easter! Hi! I hope that someone shows up today, otherwise I'm going to speak for uh, some hours uh, by myself, which is fine, because I know that some of you still watch the recordings later on, so that's fine. Since it's Easter's day, and I believe that most of you are probably going to enjoy the holidays, I'm probably going to not go forward with the program, but just do some more exercises, some experiments, or interact with you. If there's anybody in the house, then you can propose me whatever you want me to do, what, what you want to see together, if you want to rehearse something. I was thinking about, for example, um, creating the Inglorious Certificate of Survival. This could be a nice exercise that we can do for um, as practice and also to yeah to rehearse some HTML and CSS um, and then I've got Bobby who asked me to do uh, the famous pipe function which I usually call compose which is a very advanced topic and since it's so advanced and it's not really that important uh, for your career then maybe I can do this today so um, only the few people that really, really want to know this optional mm, topic uh, are able to, to see it. And everybody else can just enjoy their Easter and that's it. Uh, a note on my casual uh, appearance. Um, yeah, I got my hair, which is pretty untamable today. So uh, right two minutes before the stream, I tried to tame it with some water. So that's why it looks a bit wet. And uh, another thing that I want to show you is my cool t-shirt. I love it. See that? <laughs> because we are looking for unicorns, startups that make billions of dollars. And I hope that you will be one of those billionaires one day. And if you will be, then just say thanks <laughs> or just say hello. And that's it. That's fine for me. So let's start right away that there's already people that is that are that are speaking to me okay that's fine that's fine um so today's lesson is the easter special just like we did the christmas special a new year's special in 2020 so as you can see it's not lesson 22 it will be a lesson uh, uh yeah easter special i don't remember if i wrote it yeah i wrote it on the stream info so Everything's fine. So, uh, I don't know, I can start with, um, with the Inglorious Certificate. Uh, I would say something like this. Uh, I would say Certificate of Attendance on, um, on Google. And I look for some images. And I can look for some nice looking Certificate of Attendance to just copy from it. I don't want something too fancy because I'm probably going to put a lot of fancy stuff myself because I want this uh, certificate of attendance to look a little bit like my website ingloriouscoders.it so I don't know if I'll be able to add the logo since the logo is a react thing uh, but definitely I would like to use the colors and the fonts that I'm using here probably or probably that's too too fancy so I will have to issue a uh, a plain certificate instead of that. So I see this one, for example, this is pretty ugly and it also has this text that uh, is an arc, which is probably pretty difficult to do in plain HTML, probably impossible. And we have to resort to SVG in order to bend text or yeah, do something like this. Oh, Tiago, good morning team, you're there. Why are you here? I expected you to enjoy your Easter rather than watching uh, a stupid guy um, speaking by himself, but uh, thanks a lot for sticking in. Um, so, I was looking for some certificate of attendance just to, you know, to copy and uh, create one for you guys. This is nice, uh, it has a lot of uh, strange geometric stuff in the border, and then your name would be comprised in two leaves, which makes not much sense actually, but um, yeah. Uh, this is pretty ugly. This is also pretty ugly, but at least it does its work. Uh, I see a lot of uh, of text here. 
which I don't want to put. I, I don't know, even know what to put in the certificate of attendance. So, oh, there's also perfect attendance. Um, I saw one that I really liked before and probably it's this one. This one has the logo and then it just has some... Yep, it... Yeah, I accept. Um, this one is fine because it has everything I need. Uh, this seems to need a couple of signatures and I just have one signature, which is mine. <laughs> so... I don't know if, uh, well, yeah, this is fine, but I wouldn't know what's, what to put. Or maybe these are not just placeholders for a signature. This is just, um, yeah, it's text, and then I can put my signature somewhere here. Oh, this could be fine. Um, it, it's a good start. Maybe it's a good start. So, okay, let's try with this one. I would like to create a certificate of attendance and I'm going to start with the new file called... Uh... Sorry Emily, what are you doing today? Um, yeah, since I believe that not many people are going to join today because they are busy uh, enjoying their, hist their Easter, um, I was thinking about doing some exercises on the HTML, CSS, JavaScript side. Bobby asked me to also have a look at the pipe function, which I call the compose function. And that's a very advanced topic that since it's so advanced, it's quite optional. So I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to expose this topic only for the few people that really, really are interested to that topic, just like Bobby. Um, but you can also propose something. Uh, if you want to rehearse anything, I can do it. I'm not sure I want to go forward with the program because I, uh, as I said, I, I expect not many people to join today. I see you, but I don't see other people here. Let's see if the stream chat tells me. I see Tina, maybe. I see Crazy OQ, Glamours, and you, Tiago. So if this is actually the the number of people attending, it means that there's no Bobby, no Sao, uh, no Date, no, I don't know, no one, <laughs> no one's here. So probably uh, I don't want to go forward with the program. I prefer you guys to enjoy your Easter. So um, yeah, I'll start with the creating this certificate of attendance, my certificate of attendance. It will be an HTML file that I'll be able to hopefully uh, print or transform into PDF and then I can digitally sign this PDF and then I can give the certificate to you guys, those who followed me all along. And this is an extra feature that I wanted to give you guys at the end of the, of the program. As you know, uh, I promised I would have created an online portfolio with you guys. Uh, we would have created a community of people that help each other. And there's also this part of uh, having a certificate and then maybe also recommendations uh, from me. So, yeah, since we have time, let's why not do a certificate? So that's what I'm going to do in the Easter special. I'm going to create a new folder called uh, Certificate of... Uh, well, not attendance. This is a certificate of, of survival for me because I know that my courses are tough. And... That's why the most important part is not that you attended, but it's that you survived. Certificate of survival. And also put inglorious coders. Oops, pipe certificates of survival. Okay. <clears throat> then um, we can start placing all the things that we want to place. Uh, here I see an image, a logo, and I don't know if I can put the SVG logo, it would be nice. Uh, but if I want to put this SVG dynamic logo, then I have to turn my project into a React project, which is very advanced. I can, I can do it. I'm barely surviving. No, come on, you're doing great. 
so I don't know if I want to also put the dynamic logo. Maybe I will put a static version of the logo if it works. If it doesn't work, I'll put something else. And um, then I can say certificate of attendance. This seems to be an... Uh, I would put an H2 because this is also... Uh, an, this is bigger, so this seems to be an H1. So I'll say... I will copy almost exactly what I see here. Certificate of survival and before that there's a logo and then what do we have this certifies that this is your name so I will put a P this certifies I don't like this Th this and wh what is this uh, I'll say this uh, how do you say this document I don't know um, certifies that then we've got your name and I will put the name in in an h3 and I will say Tiago Tiago am I writing your name correctly I, I hope so I'm going to oh you're a professional road racing cyclist congratulations I thought that you were a chemical engineer <laughs> Okay, I think it was like this, right? Tiago Machado. And there's also a designer. <laughs> You've got so many people that share your name. You're a seasoned design leader, educator, and maker of digital experiences. Well done, Tiago. <laughs> anyway, yeah, okay. I think that it's correct. Okay, okay. So, Tiago Machado, and then has attended and completed. Has attended and survived i'm sorry i have to put the survival thing uh but uh, we can we can change it of course and then medium management program and here i'll put an h1 which says which says inglorious academy okay and then given on this day 20th august 2020 uh this was not given in one day is there anything that that says the, the, the span of the course. Ooh, this is also cool. Certificate, the certificate is presented to blah, 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 in recognition of all standing attendance at our event. Yeah, but which event? <laughs> no, I don't like this one. Um, okay, so this was, again, awarded on this day. Oh, okay, this is nice. Uh, surprise, no, so I can say awarded on this day on this day day of month year oh, this is pretty ugly um, it's a usual name yes oh okay okay I didn't know that I hear, I heard the name Tiago for the, for the first time I went to I went to Portugal once I went to Lisbon uh, but I never heard the name Tiago so I learned something um let's put let's put the current date for now uh what is the current date today is the 3rd of april so april 3rd 2021 and today is saturday saturday blah 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 okay and then what do we have in the certificate that we had here then we've got held at the carrions next time visit porto it's a beautiful city oh uh, yeah i've got a friend from porto and um, I should definitely go there. Held at the carry is. Are you in Porto? I I went to Lisbon for uh, an event. What was that? It was the this huge event about uh, startups. Ah, oh, what was that event? Oh, I don't have to, uh, enough memory. What, what is that event about startups in Lisbon? It's a huge one. Don't remember. And you know what? I won the, uh, a free ticket to that event due to my contributions on the open source world on GitHub. So that's cool. Um, yeah, I got a free... A closed town called Matosinhos, actually. Oh, okay, okay. Matosinhos. I hope that's Matosinhos. 
I hope that I'm pronouncing it well. I don't want to misspell. Okay, Matosinhos. And that's a beautiful place. Seems lovely. Ooh. Next to the seaside. Okay, and where is it located? Oh, okay, it's north, north east, northwest of Porto. Very nice. And Porto is located where compared to Lisbon? There's Lisbon. Oh, okay, very, very far actually, very far in the north. So I've got this friend from Porto, and she usually uh, goes back and forth, I think, from Porto to Lisbon. I think she goes by train. Nice. Yeah, and there is the European Innovation Academy in Cascais, but I never went there because I attended the European Innovation Academy in Italy, in Qatar, and in China, but so far I was not able to do it in, in Cascais. Maybe I will do it next, next year. And then, um, no, 300 kilometers, okay. And then we have, what was that place where I attended that? Oh my God, I don't remember. My memory is completely gone. <laughs> was it even Lisbon? I don't remember that much water. <laughs> Wasn't it in Porto? No, it was not in Porto. Come on. Have no idea. Oh my God. I should look at my emails or my calendar to see what happened. It, it was probably last year or two years ago, but I, I don't have enough memory. I don't have much enough RAM in my, in my brain. I usually remember everything that is needed for work, but I don't remember the places I've been. And this is a, a kind of worrying sometimes. That's why we need a certificate, because this way I will remember you for eternity. Okay, so um, held at the Carey Institute, presented by, okay, we can say this, held, um, held at the Carey Institute looks a lot like this one here. So I would say that it's an H3. Held on, well, on Twitch. <laughs> uh, or I can use inglorious coders like this. Lisbon, it's big. Maybe you don't. You didn't have the opportunity to go close to the sea. Um, yes, probably. Or maybe I went to the seaside and I don't remember it. <laughs> really, <laughs> don't know. Uh, then comma. Uh, then we've got London from March. Blah blah blah. But I think that this is on the left and this is on the right. So I'll put a div here that allows me to place this thing on the left and I will put also a P which says London from March 8, 15, 2020 so this will be uh, I don't know, held on Twitch channel Inglorious Coders or yeah, of course it's the channel Inglorious Coders I can just say from October October 17th, 2020 to, well, I don't know when we're going to finish. Uh, I have no idea when we're going to finish. I would say that we should have finished, well, last, last week. Probably we'll finish uh, by the 1st of May, or maybe not. Let's, let's put the 1st of May. May 1st, 2021. At least for now and this is a div and I think that we should place all these things into some sort of uh, flex box situation here uh, so I can uh, maybe use a div that wraps all this part and then this is the left child this is the right child so I can do something like create a div I will call it flex and inside of this div, I will put these two. One is this div on the left, and the other one is the div on the right. And the div on the right says, presented by... Well, I don't like presented by. Uh, I would say that the teacher was 
but okay let's put presented by I don't care about the content right now and then my paragraph is myself so Matteo Anthony oh come on Anthony Mistretto Okay, this could be the structure of our HTML. Let's open it on the live server and it looks like crap, which is supposed to be. So, okay, now that we've got this, uh, I'm going to put also the logo. Um, I think I do have a logo somewhere in my projects. I have multiple versions of that logo, actually. So I'm going to look at my stuff. As you can see, I'm very open. <laughs> I am showing you everything, but at least not the source code of my clients. This is where I could get in trouble. Uh, if I go to images, logos, okay, I've got a dark, a black logo and a white logo. And maybe I also want a transparent logo, semi-transparent logo, but I don't know. So I'm going to copy both of these logos, and I'm going to put them inside of that same folder so I can just use whatever I want later on. So Academy, Glorious Portfolio, going to the last one, which is Easter Special, Certificate Survival, and I'm putting these two logos here. And I'm going to use for now the white logo, which is a PNG, right? White PNG. And now it's still crap, but I can start writing some CSS. So I'm going to create a new file called style.css. I'm going to import this style.css inside of here. So style, nope, <laughs> link CSS. Yep, that's it. And now we're able to finally start styling this thing. So for example, what about the logo? The logo is the image, but I want to call it just logo. So anything that has a class of logo, but it should have a class of logo. I usually prefer going with the class names and IDs instead of uh, the name of the tag. Because this way I can put another image which is not an, a logo and this will be styled differently. So if I want the logo, the logo should be big, but not that big. Um, how big should this be? I don't know. Well, not this big. Let's let's say height. What about a hundred pixels? Is it too much? Oh, that's already fine. Okay, some um, pure CSS, no SAS. I'm disappointed. You want SAS? I can do SAS. But yeah, if you want to, we can do some SAS. Why not? So how do how do I use SAS in my project? If it, especially if it's a, a plain HTML and SAS project. Uh, yeah. By the way, hi Bobby. <laughs> so I can do something like this. When you install SAS on the command line, you'll be able to run the SAS executable to compile SAS and SCSS files to .css files. For example, SAS the scss file and then we've got the results index.css learn more about sas you install it with blah 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 you blah 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 okay so sas can be used as always as a um, node.js module a node.js package which means that i need to turn this project into a node.js project and this is already well, this is something that we already did at a certain point. I remember we did it. I don't remember why we did it, but we did. Uh, oh yeah, because we wanted to install ESLint and um, and what else and Pretia. So in order to install ESLint, we had to turn all the portfolio actually into an npm project. In fact, we also created the package JSON with that command line uh, uh, thing. So we can do the same for this uh, small sub project. So I'm going to the folder certificate of survival and I'm going to say npm init, which is going to initialize this folder as an npm project, as a node package. And it's going to ask me for things. Certificate of survival is the package name. Yes. Version 100. Why not? Description. I don't know. Uh, 
uh, digitally sign certificates that students can brag about after the academy is over. Oh, I got it wrong. Okay. Entry point, blah, blah, blah. Test command, none. Git repository, who cares? Keywords, none. Author, me. Uh, Matteo Anthony Mistretta. And then my email. Not this one. And then we've got my website too. Why not? Too fast. Okay. And license is... MIT. I prefer MIT. I don't know. It's the same. Is this okay? Yes, of course, but I got something wrong because I digitally signed. This is what I wanted to change. So as soon as I finish this um, questionnaire, I can still open the package JSON and change it uh, to my needs. And then I can now install SAS as a dependency. How do I install SAS as a dependency? They say I can do it like this, but I don't like it. I want to install SAS as a dev dependency for this project. So I'm going to instead use this other command npm install dash dash save dash dev. So it's saved as a development of dependency, which makes no sense. I can just save it and that's fine. But just to be uh, even more clear, I will say install it as a dev dependency. And then I'll say SAS npm install save dev SAS. The only difference from this command to this other is that here they use dash g which installs sas as a global dependency so a, a dependency that is installed system wide and i can use it and reuse it for multiple projects but i don't think this is a good idea i think and it's not only me that it is better to instead having sas uh, saved as a dependency for this project only so if there are two different versions of SAS for two projects, uh, they are still kept separated. And mm, it's, sometimes it happens that one project breaks or has a sp strange behavior because I updated SAS for another project and this project is now affected by that update. Instead, if I have the, uh, a fixed version of SAS for each project, then each project will be independent from the others. So that's why I'm installing SAS locally instead of globally. Another thing that I can do instead is not installing SAS at all. And I can uh, run SAS with NPX. I can do something like NPX SAS. And this is going to check if SAS is already installed and cached in the system. If it's not, it's going to be downloaded from the internet and it's going to be cached and executed on the parameters that I specify. And this is also fine because it's not exactly like installing SAS globally. Every time you uh, execute this command, the newest version of SAS will be used. Uh, but sometimes I don't want to have the latest version of SAS. I want to have the current version of SAS, this, the version of SAS that I'm sure, 100% sure it works. So that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to npm install dash dash save dash dev SAS. And this is what's going to happen. If I press enter, it's going to be uh, downloaded. And now I see it as listed is, as one of those dev dependencies here. So now I've got SAS available and uh, I'm pretty sure that, yeah, we've got also the folder, not modules, which doesn't contain only SAS. It contains a bunch of other uh, folders, which are dependencies of SAS. And then we've got the .bin folder, which has the executable. So if my environment is working properly, I can just say SAS-V to get the version of SAS. And it's not going to work because it doesn't know about V. Maybe it's version, maybe it's... Uh, Oh, dash dash version. Okay, if I say SAS dash dash version, then it's saying, okay, it's a 132.8 compiled with Dart to JS. So apparently SAS was uh, written in Dart and then was compiled into JavaScript. Okay, uh, some of you could have this command not working because you don't have 
the proper environment variables uh, in place, but you can still do something like npx sas dash dash version, and this should work. It just npx is a very versatile command that checks if you have a local version of SAS installed and it just executes it. If you don't have it, it will download it, uh, cache it and execute it. So since now it is present in my system, npx SAS is not downloading anything. It's just executing and this just works. So this is what we are going to, to use right now. Or maybe you are going to change some of the scripts here. So now that SAS is installed, I can probably turn this style CSS into another file. Uh, we can use SAS or we can use SCSS, which is usually the preferred way. SAS is a language that is slightly different from uh, CSS, but it compiles to CSS. It's actually pretty similar to CSS, but you just remove all the square, all the curly braces and all the semicolons, and you're left with something like this. Um, instead, CSS needs uh, the curly braces and the semicolons. Well, SCSS is in between. It has all the features of SAS, which we will see. It's uh, about having uh, nested rules, nested properties, and also the use of mixins, the use of variables, etc., etc. But it still has curly braces and semicolons, which apparently are very important for some people. So yeah, this is the in-between. It's not a SAS file, it's an SCSS file. And hopefully, if I do something like npx SAS given that file, st style SCSS, into style.css, you see that we've got two new files, style.css and style.css.map, which are the compiled version and the source map, which is a strange file that allows me to uh, retrieve the source code from the compiled code, even though the compiled code is actually pretty easy to see, to, to, to understand. So yeah, we've got SAS in place. We can create this, you can continue working on this SAS file. And whenever we need to, we can compile the SAS file into the CSS. The index.html is, is already uh, pointing to that CSS file. So that's it. But I think that there's too, much, too many things going on here. So I'm going to also create a folder called, for example, logos. And I'm going to put the two logos here, uh, white and black. I want to organize things better. And then I'll also create a new folder called styles. And I'm going to put the style CSS, which is the compiled version, style CSS map, why not? And style S CSS in here. Okay, so everything is a little cleaner now. Um, but I have to update my references. Now the link is not to style anymore, but to styles style CSS. So I have to put styles slash style CSS. And the same goes with logo, because the logo is now in the folder called logos white PNG. And I think that's it. Now every time I want to uh, compile my SAS file, I have to actually do this command, but this command is not good anymore. I have to go to into styles, style CSS, and then styles, style CSS. This is how I compile my file nowadays. And since it's such a complex command, I don't want to issue this command every single time. So I can go to my package JSON and in my scripts, I can just remove this test script, which is makes no sense. And I can create another script here. I can call it, um, I don't know, I can call it style. And this script will actually do exactly the same thing that I see here. It does sas of styles slash style.scss into styles slash style.css. I didn't put npx. It's not npx sas. I'm not copying exactly the same thing. I'm just doing SAS because the package JSON knows that we're going to use NPX. So 
what happens here is that it's going to actually do npx sass blah 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 and how do i use this i'm clearing the console now that i've got this script in my package json i can do npm run style i'm going to run the script that i've got in this package json and i think it works Yep, it works. No, it doesn't. Error reading. Okay, I got one thing wrong. It was styles, style, SSS, not styles, styles. And now it's working. So, yep, everything is fine. It's still doing this compiled thing. Another thing that I usually do is I want to not uh, synchronize with my Git repository the compiled files because GitHub and Git in general has the purpose of uh, saving and storing and synchronizing only your source code, not the compiled stuff. The compiled stuff is going to uh, be compiled every single time you issue this command. So I don't care about saving the compiled. I want to save the source code. That's why I usually create a new file here called git ignore, which is a configuration file that allows me to specify, hey git, please, just forget about this kind of file. I can do something like a wildcard, like um, asterisk.css and also asterisk.css.map, which are the two types of files that I don't want to synchronize with the repository. And if I save this, you will see that style.css and style.css.map are now uh, dimmed out because they are not going to be synchronized on the server. The only thing that is going to be synchronized is the style.scss. So now Bob is happy. We have SAS in place and we can use it. So how do we use SAS? Is everything still working? Not really. I don't see the logo now. So I broke something. Logos, white PNG. And logo is in the wrong place okay now i've got the logo okay so yay sas okay so now i've got everything in place and the only problem now is that every single time we want to do some changes on this sas file we have to remember to compile the sas file we have to run npm run style every single time which is kind of uh, boring, actually, but it's fine. It's fine. Uh, everything for my students. Okay, so um, I want to do something very similar to this, as we said. So the first thing that I see is that probably everything should have a text align center. Everything. Yep. So I can say it. I can do something like, hey, you know, everything should have a text align of center. And now this is not working. Why? Because I have to compile my SAS file and now it's working. This is pretty annoying. Uh, also, I think that text align center works even if I just place it on the parent, on the container of everything else and not to every single element. So what if I say the body has text align center. Uh, I have to npm run style and yeah this still works as you can see we don't need to place the text align center to every single element. This is already <laughs> nice just nice looking for me. I can just just place it like this and it's fine but no I will continue. So one thing that I would like to tackle is this flex thing. I want one thing placed on the left and one thing placed on the right. So I will say that the flex element here, and we are still not using the features of uh, SAS, but we will do it. So this flex element should have a display of flex. And let's see what happens. Okay, it is flex. It's not exactly where I wanted it, but it's flex. What I want also is to have those items justified uh, probably with space, I don't know if space around, space between, or space evenly. Probably I would say space around, but we can have a look at it and, uh, and see for ourselves. 
Okay, space around is like this. But I don't know, it looks like, yeah, one is bigger than the other, which is not what I want. I want them to be big, uh, uh, equally big. What if I do space between? Space between is fine, but those are now, um, as you can see, attached to the borders, which is not exactly what we have here. Well, yeah, we can say it's uh, attached to the borders, but we have a lot of padding uh, around. So it could be space between, actually. Or what about space evenly? Space evenly has some, well, even spacing. So we've, we've got this spacing in between, which is exactly equal to the spacing that we have on the left and on the right. But I don't think this is what we want. I think that we want space between. So it has some space between, but not, but not on the left and on the right. The space that we will add on the left and on the right is actually some padding that we put uh, around the whole thing. Speaking of padding, the body itself usually has some, uh, not some padding, but some margin. And usually we don't like this margin being automatically added by the body. We want to actually uh, reset this property. And we want to add our own padding and our own things. Uh, but every time I change things, I have to compile. And I'm going to forget this every single time. Why would presented by be bolded? Isn't the name of the presenter more important? Yes, you are completely right. I was just looking at this thing and I was trying to copy it. But then we can, of course, diverge from this thing that I'm copying it, that I'm copying and maybe make the Jenkins founder be bold and colored, etc, uh, etc. Et yeah, you're completely right. Um, well, we're going to approach this step by step. So the problem with this flex, however, is that these two guys are not the same width. So is there something that I can do to have these two guys have the same width? I think so. I think that we can use something like flex grow. Let's see. Flex grow. Oh, flex grow. Oh, come on. Flex row is one. And this will take all the available space. And what about this one? Let's put flex grow here too. And now these two are trying to take exactly the same space, but no, still no can do. I see them uh, not really taking exactly the same amount of space. There's still the, the, the longer one, which is trying to, to be as, as big as possible. So no. Uh, I don't know if there's a thing that I can do with flex, but if I cannot do this, I can use CSS grid instead. But let's see Flexbox again, some documentation about Flexbox, and uh, shed some light on how to make those elements equally, uh, equal, to have an equal width. Um, I usually use this article, which is Perfect, a complete guide to Flexbox by CSS Tricks. You already know this article. So I'm using Display Flex, and all these properties on the left are the properties that you put on the container. The properties on the right are the properties that you apply to the children. So maybe you can use also these ones. So Flex Flow, Space Between, this is what we've done. And then we've got the Align Items, um, which is Vertical Alignment, and we don't really care about this for now. Align content is also not really that important right now. And that's it for the, for the parent. So let's have a look at the children. For the children, you can place an order, and we know. We can use flex grow, which is exactly what we tried so far. We also have flex shrink, but we don't want things to, to shrink. There's also this property flex which is a combination of flex grow, flex shrink, and flex bases. We've got a line self, and that's it. So we don't have anything more than that. And then I'm afraid that we cannot just use the... I don't know, I, I think we cannot just use the flex grow. By the way, what if we want to apply the flex grow to every children of flex? So there's two ways. One way is the 
CS, the, the CSS way, which is flex all. This is telling that every descendant of flex should have, for example, flex grow of one, which is also not correct because this way we're placing flex grow even on the grandchildren of flex so this is not what we want we can limit this thing by saying only the divs but this would apply still to the internal divs to a grandchild that is a div of flex what we actually want to do usually is to put also the greater than symbol which allows to uh, address only the direct children of flex and not also the grandchildren. So this is fine. And this is the CSS way. But in SAS, we can even nest those properties. And I can put properties inside of the, of the I can place rules inside of the of other rules. So in here, I can do, hey, div flex grow of one. This has exactly the same meaning as saying every descendant of flex, which is of kind div. And if I also want to put the greater than symbol, I have to use another special symbol that is SAS specific, but it's also identical to other languages such as uh, stylus or less. You have to put the ampersand. This means this element. So if I say and pretty, this is addressing everything that is flex, but it's also pretty. So it also has the class of pretty. This is how you, you create something that is a little more specific. Otherwise, you can do something like, for our case, you can do, hey, starting from here, go to the immediate divs, to the immediate children. And this is exactly the same uh, behavior as this one here. If you don't believe me, I can just keep it like that. I can compile and we can have a look at the style CSS. And you can see that now that rule was actually translated into the same thing that I showed you before, dot flex greater than div. So as you can see, SAS has this cool feature and every CSS preprocessor has this feature, which is about uh, nesting properties. And now we've got exactly the same thing that we had before, which is not what we want because every uh, element here Every div here has not exactly the same width. And I'm not really sure how to solve this thing on, with Flexbox. I know how to solve this thing with CSS Grid. But if we still want to keep things uh, easy with Flexbox, I can have a look at Flexbox children equal width. Or maybe Flexbox make children equal width. Flexbox not giving equal width to elements. Um, there is an important bit that is not mentioned in the article to which you linked, and that is flex basis. By default, flex basis is auto. From the spec, if the specified flex basis is auto, the used flex basis is the value of the flex item's main size property. This can itself be the keyword auto, which sizes the flex item based on its contents. Each flex item has a flex basis which is sort of like its initial size. Then from there, any remaining free space is distributed proportionally based on flex row among the items. With auto, the basis is the content size, blah, blah, blah. So you just need to put flex basis zero and this should solve our problem. Flex basis zero. We compile it. We go back to our certificate. And now I think it's working. Yep. So this is the div. This is the other div. And they have exactly the same width. Nice. Very good. Okay, so Right now we solved the problem of displaying these two, uh, one on the left and one on the right. Then what can we do now? Uh, we can use a different font for things. So I could use any kind of font. I would like to try to use these fonts here that I used here uh, because this way it's more inglorious. So what kind of font did I use here? I used ethnocentric for inglorious coders. And we can have a look at ethnocentric font on da font. Is it there also on Google fonts, maybe? Maybe Google fonts. No, there's Orbitron, which is another 
uh, important font that I want to use. It's this one here. But apparently ethnocentric is not on Google fonts, is in da font. I want to reject all. Ethnocentric is uh, freely downloadable. And yeah, I want to use it. But how do I use it? I can just download it or can I just link it somehow? I think I have to download it. If you'd like to embed this font in an app, ebook, on the web, or anything that's not covered by the desktop license agreement, with, visit the link below. You'll find distributed of different licenses, blah, blah, blah. Let me see this one. Oh, I'm afraid I cannot use this one. I hope I can. Uh, generic exporting events, related posts. Okay, get it now. Ooh, 12 fonts for $29.95. Single styles from the... Uh, okay, and what if I don't want to purchase the font? You know what? I'm going to start using it as I already used it. It's 100% free, it says. It says there are two free. Yeah, okay, I'm going to download it from here. First of all, I'm going to download it from here, and then we'll see. Uh, if I have to uh, use another font, that's fine. So, in Glorious Portfolio, uh, Easter Special, Certificate Survival. I'm going to place the zip file in here for now. And then here it is. Uh, there's also an HTML. Typodermic fonts, installation, allowed, not allowed. So, allowed, all this stuff. Not allowed, ebook, app, web page embedded. Product creation platform. What does it mean embedded? I, we're going to create something similar to a poster or a banner, actually. I think so. Or a business card. Oh, web page not embedded. So we can create a web page with this font. But it has to be not embedded, which I have no idea what it means. Okay, so we're allowed to use it. And we've got this font here. What is this PDF? Oh, this is the license agreement. We've got these two. TTF, ethnocentric, ethnocentric regular and ethnocentric regular italic. Uh, okay, so I'm going to extract these two and I'm going to put them in a new folder called fonts, for example. And now we should have this folder here called fonts, which has these two ethnocentric files. But how do I include a font in my web page? I don't know, let's ask Google. How to include a TTF font in HTML using CSS. So apparently we have to create something like this. Well, let's go to the, okay, font face. It's an at rule. Font face, you define the font family and then you define the URL where to get those fonts. And you can specify multiple sources, multiple formats, so, okay, I think I know how to use it, maybe. I think I have to use something like font face and then font family in which I describe the name of the font and I'm going to call it ethnocentric. And then I'm going to use SRC URL. And then from here, I don't know if I have to put the relative path, probably. So if it's the relative path, I have to go back one folder and I'll go to fonts and then we've got ethnocentric like this. And I probably need to also specify the format, which in case of TTF is true type. Format is true type. Probably it's like this. Uh, they, they use also the single quotes, but I'm pretty sure that you don't need those single quotes, but it looks better. So why not? Bobby says the term embedding means the to place the content on your page or your website as opposed to only linking to it. In this way, readers don't have to leave your site in order to consume additional content. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, embedding is this in general, but I don't know how, how, what, what they mean in this particular scenario. But anyway, we'll discover it maybe. Uh, so now if I want to have something using 
this uh, ethnocentric font, what should it be? It should be in the Inglorious Academy. And the Inglorious Academy, if I remember correctly, is the only H1 we have. So I can do something like, hey, uh, the H1 should have a font family of ethnocentric. And hopefully this ju should just work. I have to compile, of course. Ooh, it worked. Inglorious Academy. Nice. And what about the other font? The other font is this one here, and it's called Orbitron, if I remember. Orbitron, yeah. And Orbitron is on Google Fonts. And you can just download the family of fonts and do exactly what I did uh, a while ago. Or we can probably also try another way, because sometimes fonts can be, as you were saying, instead of embedded, they can just be linked. And I'm going to link this... Uh, Orbitron thing. So if I just want the regular and I want to, to import it as a link, I just copy this one here and I put it on the HTML. Otherwise, I can use the import rule here. And yeah, I'm going to probably use the import if it works. And then I can specify font family Orbitron or a fallback to sans serif. I'm going to try the import now. So I'm going to use an import here at the start, something like this. And this is going to download the font for me. And now I can say that any H2 has a font family, oh, come on, font family of Orbitron. I think it's like this. And yes, but I have to <laughs> compile. And now I've got Orbitron. Yep, Certificate of Survival in Orbitron. Uh, I don't like the spacing. It's too too narrow. Uh, did I change the spacing here? Font weight normal, font size. No, I, apparently I didn't change the spacing. Okay. Uh, I don't know you guys, but it looks too too crowded. I would like to 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 make the letters uh, be uh, have more air in between. Um, let's see if we can um, change letter spacing CSS. Oh, there is a property called letter spacing. Letter spacing normal. Letter spacing 0 0.1 em. Letter spacing pi in pixels. You can do whatever you want here. So let's try for now to do it here. Uh, letter spacing is, well, normal is exactly this one. 1 rem is huge, but I can also do 0 0.1 rem, and this is already better, or 2, or 3, or 4. I don't know. Let's say 0.25 for now. Yeah, 0.25. Okay, so every H2 will have a font family of Orbitron, but also a letter spacing of 0 0.25 REM. And of course, this is not applying, and, uh, and that's what we have so far. Okay, um, what else, what else, what else? Uh, let's see. The colors, maybe. Or maybe the color should be one of the latest things. So in here, to what is relative, the rem? Rem is proportional to the root. So if the root says that the font family is... Uh, uh, not the font family. The font size is 16 pixels, then one rem is 16 pixels. But if the font family, if the font size is 14 pixels, then one REM is 14 pixels. So it's uh, based on the root. And apparently the font size by default is 16 pixels because I didn't change anything. But just to make sure, maybe we can place font size to 16 pixels in the body or maybe in the HTML. And I don't know where is the better way, the, the better, the best place to place these things. Uh, I put it in the body and it's not showing, of course, but now it is showing. Yep, font size 16 pixels. Now, uh, now that I see it, certificate survival is probably too wide. 
<laughs> I don't like it anymore. Uh, as you can see, it's very, it's a very creative thing. Um, yeah, I probably like it better with 0 0.2. Uh, or, or probably even, uh, even narrower than that. Uh, speaking of embedding and linking, so is there a way to, uh, to link the ethnocentric font instead of uh, downloading and embedding it? Maybe that was the problem. I, can, I should not embed by downloading and using it. I should actually maybe link it somehow. But I don't see the way to link this. Also available at Creative Fabrica. What is that? No thanks. Okay, download for free. All freebies come with our commercial license. Log in to download. How did you do it on your website? I think I downloaded it and I'm now starting to fear that I'm actually uh, out of law <laughs> because I shouldn't have embedded it like this. Uh, but I don't know. I don't. I, it's not really clear to me. Wait a second, if you'd like to embed this font in an app, ebook, on the web, or anything that's not covered by the desktop license agreement, visit the link below. Okay, what is the desktop license agreement? It's probably the thing that we have here. This is a legal contract. Installation, your invoice indicates the number of workstations in which you may install the fonts. For every workstation for which you are licensed, you may also install the fonts on a portable computer. Okay, but I don't want to install the font anywhere. I just want to use it on the web. Termination, custom agreement. Uh, okay, uh, okay, This I think that this is the important part, OEM. So if I want to sell my application embedding the font and install it on multiple desktop apps, workstation, etc. This is completely different from just using it freely on the web or for my business cards, etc. etc. I'm pretty sure I'm uh, abiding the law, but I, I will probably have a look at it further. Or if you can help me on this uh, after the lesson. So that's fine, that's fine. Uh, for now, it's fine. It's just everything is just open source here. So now that we've got this, uh, now I see that this is too big. <laughs> I don't like it that big. Whenever I go back to the to the thing, it doesn't look good. Now it looks better for some reason, and maybe after a while it will not be that good looking to me. Now, one thing that I want to do is to have something that can be easily uh, transformed into a PDF. A PDF that I can then sign and uh, give it to you. And I would say that the proper proportions of these PDF should be an A4 sheet of paper. So if you want, you can also print it uh, easily. So is there a way to make the HTML being an A4 size. How to make an HTML page in A4 paper size? Ages ago, in November 2005, Alistapart.com published an article on how they published a book using nothing but HTML and CSS. Here's an excerpt of the article. You just say that the page should have a size of 7 inches by 925 and the margin should be something like this. Having a US-based publisher, we're giving the page size in inches. We're being Europeans, continue with metric measurements, CSS accepts both. After setting up the, the after setting the up, after setting up the page size and margin, we needed to make sure that our page breaks in the right places. The following excerpt shows how page breaks are generated after chapters and appendices. This is awesome. Anyway, since you want to print A4, you'll need different dimensions, of course. So size is this one, margin is this one. Change the margins as you want them to be. The article dives into things like setting page breaks, etc. There's an edit here, an article at Smashing Mag Magazine. Then on 2018, we've got this, media print, body with blah, 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 in centimeters. In case you think you really need pixels, you should actually avoid using pixels. You will have to take care of choosing the correct DPI for printing. Blah, blah, blah. It would be fairly easy to force the web browser to display the page with the same pixels I mentioned as A4. However, there may be a few quirks and they are using pixels, which you should not. So I think that I'll stick with this thing here. 
this is a media query and it says that for the screen for screens you just use the usual uh, width and uh, height but for print you are going to force these dimensions I would say that we should force these dimensions everywhere not only for print but for now I'm going to use this one uh, so I'm going to put it uh, here right after the body because after the body I want to override uh, the rules that I have for the body let's see what happens now I've got this certificate which behaves exactly the same but if I try to print it control P okay this is what happens uh, it's not exactly what I want and first of all because I want the dimension to be exactly on the opposite I want a, a landscape version of this not a portrait so I'm going to say that the height is 21 and the width is 29.7 this should make my certificate behave slightly differently yeah the layout should be landscape okay I still see some margins that I don't want to be there I don't know why they are there uh, let's just remove those margins for now and see what happens Hmm, okay, um, not really exactly that much better. I should probably uh, also place all my contents uh, somehow centered. I don't know if they are centered currently in the print layout. Maybe I should say that the contents should be centered. But another thing that I want to try is also to remove the media query and say that the body has this width and this height. So I will be able to see it not only on print layout, but also while working on it. Okay, so this is what we have now. We've got this body which has exactly these dimensions. And I see that the body seems to have the correct dimensions, but the content inside is not fine because now the the web page is bigger than the body so we've got a lot of margin here on the right and the content of the body is up up instead of being correctly centered in the page so i think that i want to also do something like this i want to say that the body has a display flex a justify content of center and an align items of center which should probably take all my elements and place them in the center but I'm also aware that probably it's better to have some uh, container of all those elements that is the only container that will be centered in the body something like this let's see if anything changes actually not <laughs> Okay, so the body has this display flex, justify content, center, etc. And then we've got this div. Oh, yeah, it is centered now. It is different from before. The only thing that bugs me now is the fact that the body has this margin on the right. But it's pretty easy to change this because I can just say margin zero auto. If you remember this trick, this will make the body stay centered. So now we've got the body which is centered in the page. I don't know if we should do these things on the body or on, uh, on a div inside of that body. Maybe we should. And I also see that this div inside of the body is taking only its... Uh, it, it, it has a width that is just the content. But maybe I can do something like, again, flex grow of one. And now the div is trying again to span all the possible width. I think it's better like this. So I could say that, you know, the child of the body, this must also have a flex glow of one. I don't think that flex basis is important right now, but at least the flex grow is important. And now we've got this situation here. What happens if I try to print it now? 
Okay, nothing happens. Okay, here it is. Loading preview. Hmm, okay. It looks a bit centered. Maybe not completely centered. Or probably it's just, uh, yeah, probably it is centered. But I don't know why there's also a second page, a second empty page. But yeah, this is how it goes. Uh, I should probably also put something else like... Uh, Sometimes we also need to do something like, um, how's it called, um, overflow hidden. So in, in this way, if there is something that overflows, it's not going to, to show it. And it's going, nope, still not working. Okay, so, nope, that was not working. Okay, so probably the reason why we have the second page is that actually... Uh, this content is too big. Maybe. Maybe the content is too big, but it's not because it's uh, it's just this one. So is it a problem with paddings or I don't know? I have no idea. I'm just messing up with you guys together. Uh, let's let's just remove the media print because I don't like it. I'm going to put all this inside of the body let's close this one too um, okay we've got body with a font size of 16 pixels margin zero I'm gonna put also padding zero which makes no sense but uh, let's just remove every any spacing that we have then text align center which is more related to the font size so I'm gonna put it here uh, the height and the width and the margins are here so I can remove margin zero because we've got margin zero auto and then we've got display flex etc which are more uh, oriented to the children of this element and now everything is exactly the same as before but I see that there's some scrolling here why is there some scrolling uh, this shouldn't be scrolling or maybe it should because the actually the a4 paper is bigger than the screen size so probably he's right I should scroll it's actually pretty difficult to to now change things and understand them uh, with the, the, the body being an A4 that's why probably it's better to have the um, the what is this the height and the margin etc being only in the media print but it's actually pretty the same thing I, I don't really care yeah, let's put this uh, again into the into the media query so I can say media print body has these properties here only these ones and now if I compile this shows well enough but when I print it stays it's yeah, it stays where I want. Uh, still having this issue with the second page, but I don't want to care about it too much right now. So that's fine. Um, okay, so what else can we do? Let's see. Uh, we could put colors and we could put a background. Uh, what happens if I put this kind of background here? Or what happens if I put this blue color as the uh, frame? of the certificate so I see this border and you know what I'm just going to copy it and I would say that this is of class well this is probably an ID this is our container this is our frame we can call it frame or we could call it the certificate itself yeah our certificate is something that is inside of the body so I can place it in here but I think that it's not really that useful um, I, I don't want to just nest too many things so the certificate could have this border and you know what uh, the certificate is also the div inside of the body so I can just remove this flex grow one and place it here I don't know if it makes more sense or less sense And now we've got this uh, blue border, which is pretty awful, but it's there. Um, why, why is there some margin here? Because the mar oh, okay, because I have to remove that margin 
I forgot to put this one here. Margin is zero. And after this, this the borders will be exactly, yeah, the borders will be there. So why did I put, remove the margin from the body? Because I want to add some margin in the certificate. The certificate is something that I want to change. So the certificate can have a margin of, I don't know how much, let's see this one. If I see this, it has some margin, which can be, I don't know, let's try with three, three REM. Maybe that's too much, maybe not. Uh, well, it's quite a lot and probably can go with two REMs. Okay, a little less. And then we also want some padding because the logo and also this part is too attached. Is the padding the same as the margin? Uh, no, it seems to be a little more. Maybe the padding is three REMs. So we can say margin is that, board is that, and then padding is three REMs. Okay, so we've got some padding now. And what else, what else? Um, I would like to put the same Orbitron font to the name and also to these things here. I don't know if it makes sense, let's see. So every H2 and every H3 also will have the same font. And this is what we have. Okay, this is fine. Uh, another cool thing that I saw here is this bar, is this thick bar on top. We can do this probably. And I think that, uh, well, we have to address these two divs, which I think have no name. No, they're just children of flex. But who cares about that? We've got a rule for that. This one is here. Uh, we can say border top is two pixels solid. Uh, black for now. Oh, okay, they are too attached now. <laughs> um, yep, these should have some space in between and they do not have space in between. Okay, this is a problem and I don't think it's easy to solve other than having a second div inside which has some padding. Or maybe I can add some margin. What if I add a margin of one REM? Ooh, now we've got some, uh, some spacing there. Okay, maybe even more. Maybe much more. Maybe a margin of two REMs. Yeah, this can, this can work. So every div in here will have a border top, but it will also have a margin of two REMs. Did I say two? Yeah, I said two. The problem now is that I have too much space here at the bottom because it's uh, actually adding up all the margin and also all the padding. So that's too much. And there's no easy way to solve this thing. I can just say that the margin should be only on the right of this and on the left of this and we're not going to use any margin here. Or we can say that the margin should only be on the top or something like that. So for example, if I say that the certificate has no padding, but only a padding top, I'm just adding the padding where I want. And these will have a padding, uh, these are using a margin of two actually. Which is fine enough, but maybe not. The certificate can have also a padding bottom of 3 REM, but still we've got this problem that it adds up. Oh, come on. Padding bottom? Nope, not, still not able to write it. Okay, padding bottom of R 3 REM is too much because we have this padding bottom of 3 REM plus the margin of 2 REM. So one could say, okay, let's put the padding bottom of one REM. This way it adds one REM to the two REMs of margin and it has exactly the same height, the same spacing as this one. But I think that having these kind of um, additions and uh, 
th this is not really stable. As soon as I change something, it will break the spacing that I wanted. So, you know what? I think that the margin REM is fine, but I would say that the margin is only on the right and on the left of those divs. This way, at least, we have control. I can say that this is called left, and this is called right. And now that we've got a name for these two, I don't want to put the margin of 2 REM. I can say that, hey, you know the div called left? Well, this guy should have a margin right of 2 REM, if I'm able to write it. And the same goes with the right one. The right one should have a margin left of 2 REMs. What happens now is that we've got this, which has a margin, this, which has a margin, and no margin elsewhere. So now they are nicely placed. But now I see that there was some margin that was actually pretty neat because it's divided the previous paragraph here. Uh, how much margin do we want here? Well, probably it's exactly the same as this one. So we can also place again uh, margin top of two REMs. So, oh, come on, I have to compile. Okay, so now we've got also the margin top, and this makes a nice spacing between these two and the text above. Uh, I saw something happening here. No, everything's fine. Yep, okay. So, um, what else? Uh, maybe, I don't know if the logo is too big. Maybe the logo is too big. I don't want this to shout in Glorious Coders. Uh, where's the logo? The logo has a height of 100 pixels, which I really don't like because it's in pixels. If I want to use some REMs, then I can probably do something like, what is four REMs? I don't want to do the calculations myself. I have to multiply 16 by 4. And apparently, 16 times 4 is 64, which is already fine. And what if I say 5? Okay, this is already good. And what if I say 6? Now it's 96, which is almost 100 pixels. And for some reason, I still prefer it like this rather than than how it was before. Yeah, I'm gonna keep it like this for now. Um, okay, so another thing that I can do is add my signature. I do, oh, shouldn't the spacing be more from held on and no water on it, I guess it's space for signature? Probably, but if this is space for signature, I don't know what to place in here. This is should not be a signature. So I'm not really sure. I was looking at this thing and I thought that this was space for signatures, but then how, well, maybe this uh, needs a stamp from the Carry Institute. And I don't have such a stamp for the Inglorious Coders. Uh, maybe uh, one day I will have a stamp for Inglorious Coders, but right now I don't have it. Yeah, you can just remove one. So I can just remove this and uh, keep this on the center. This could be, yeah, but uh, then it becomes too too bland. It's just, I don't know, we can say, we can, we can have a look at it. So if I remove the left one, that's what we have now. Uh, we can also remove the margin left. We can add some more margin top. And now I've got space for my signature, but this just looks like a top-down thing. I don't know if I like it. Not really sure. Instead, this makes it m more looking a little more like a, a, a real certificate. I don't know. Uh, margin top, let's say three REM because we want to make more space for the signature or maybe even more. What if I put four REMs? Is it going to be too big? Okay, that's enough space for our REMs. But what about the print layout? Is it going to still work or is it too big? No, still, still almost good looking. 
Okay, if I want to put my signature, I do have a signature here somewhere. Let me just check. Of course, this signature has no real value, no real meaning. That's why the certificate will also be digitally signed. I bought a digital signature, which will actually make the document authentic. Uh, just, I'm not going to just use my signature uh, as, as a validation. Because you can still use my signature, you can copy paste my signature as an image and that's it. So this is not uh, good enough. So where's my signature? Do I have it here? Let's see in images. Mm, I do have my signature somewhere. I think I have it on another project called Business Manager. This was my Business Manager before uh, relying on some other things. And I, yeah, I've got my signature. I've got uh, two signatures. One is more readable and one is less readable. Let's use the less readable one. So I'm going to place it in my projects, Glorious Cutters, Academy, Gross portfolio, and then I'm um, in the Easter special, certificate survival. Uh, we don't have a folder for signatures. Why do we have a folder called bureaucracy? Well, because I want to put the bureaucracy in there. I've got some documents, uh, for example, my uh, subscription to the Italian registry of companies, etc, etc. So I've got bureaucracy there. <laughs> okay, I'm going to call it signature. Or I can just place everything in the images folder, if there is an images folders. Um, yeah, probably it's better to have an images folder. And it's not where I want it. The images folder will have logos and we'll have the signature exactly as it is. So let's remove signatures. So we've got images, logos, signature. Now the index HTML should point to the proper logo. So this is images slash logos slash white. And then we also need to put a signature somewhere. The signature will be very close to the right element. So I'm probably going to put it here image source um, images signature png alt signature and i'm going to also add the id signature i should i could put a class i could put an id i don't know i'm gonna put an id now um, the right elements element has a child which is the signature so as you can see i'm still leveraging the uh, SAS features of placing things nested, but it's not really that important. This should have a position absolute. And I will position it absolutely somewhere, somehow. And it should also have a different size. This is way too big. So the size of this should be, I don't know, with, let's find it out with eight REMs. Too small. Nine, ten. I'm going to go with 15, okay? 15 REM. So the signature is with 15 REM. And the position is absolute, but if the position is absolute, it is absolutely absolute. Maybe I want it to be absolute compared to its parent. And to make it absolute compared to its parent, I have to say that the right, which is the parent, should have a position of relative. Now, the position absolute will be absolute only relatively to the parent. And this is what we have so far. So now if the image has, for example, a top of zero, the top of zero is compared to the parent. If the parent was not position relative, then you would see that the signature is position zero compared to the root or to the topmost position relative element that it finds. So that's why we need the position relative. And here you can say top is zero for now and left is zero. So at least I can place it initially where I want to. And now since it's not positioned where I want, I can just, uh, for example, decrease the number of pixels to place it on top. I think that 60 works pretty well. 
and 60 is probably minus 4 rem. Yeah, minus 4 REM is fine. So top is minus 4 REM because I remember that 4 REM is 64. And then left. Uh, left could be placed absolutely or I could probably go with the with some formulas to place it exactly at the center. So what if I say, can I say 50%? Yes, but it's 50% starting from the from the beginning of the signature. So usually to position things exactly at the center, I have to put left 50%, but also to do a transformation that translates the element itself 50% on the left. Because this 50% is not the same 50% as the left one, is 50% of its own width. So as you can see now, it's uh, perfectly positioned on uh, perfectly centered. So I will say left is 50% and I will also do the transform of translate x minus 50%. Okay, this looks good enough. Uh, what about the print layout? Is it still working somehow? Yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I hate this border. It's very bland. So maybe we can make it better. I have no idea how to make it better. Uh, maybe we should put some, uh, some things on the corners, just like they did. This is a very nice uh, corner thing. Um, let's see if we can find something on the internet. CSS frame, for example. Oh, there is a frame tag. No, uh, I actually want to just create a, I don't know, frame effect. Maybe it's not a frame effect. Let's see what it is. Oh, this is a frame. Oh, this is a very, not, very nice actually, but it's not what I wanted. Um, no, I don't think that our documents should have any, any box shadow. Um, how can I look for it? I don't know. Uh, CSS. Uh, border decorations, maybe? Decorating the web with CSS border images. Oh, there's also the possibility to add images on the borders. What is that? Okay, this, yeah, nah, don't like it. Oh, these are images with borders. Nope, nope, this is actually something that has some oh border image yeah there is something called board e border image no that's too much not nah, too much what about uh, CSS tricks do you have any tricks for borders or it's just the usual stuff yeah we know that we can do solid dash dotted etc mm, nope Nope. Well, one thing that we can do to improve is maybe do something like this one. Uh, an outer border, which is thicker, and an uh, inner border, which is not as thick. Maybe you can already do that. So uh, that's a good reason to do something that is a certificate, but also a frame. The frame will have a border, maybe of two pixels. And we will also have inside of it a certificate which will have another kind of border and some padding. Maybe something like this. And we probably also need some margin too, because otherwise the border will, or maybe not, we can add some padding here. Uh, maybe just one REM for now. So what I'm trying to do is to have an extra div, which is the frame. And inside of that div, we've got the certificate which holds everything back again. As you can see, I'm trying to use divs as sparingly as possible, but at some point we need that. Okay, now we've got these two borders. Uh, the outer border is way too small, and I can probably lift those numbers up. For example, I don't know, four pixels, is it too much? Or I can do this with REMs, 0 0.5 REMs. This should be eight pixels, which is probably too much. Not even. No. 
I don't know, I'll see later. And then now the inner border is not enough. 0 0.25 maybe, which is exactly half. Okay, that's too much. <laughs> Uh, I want to place it here. I'm gonna put, remove this one. Okay. Um, so no, this is not not good. I would say that this should be 0 0.2, and there should also be some less padding. Okay, this looks a little more like a certificate. What do you think about it? Maybe this other border is still too thick. Maybe both of them are still too thick. I don't know. What about the print layout? Hmm. Okay. Maybe this blue is too standing out too much. I kind of like it, says Bobby. Okay, nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like it too. Maybe it's standing out too much, maybe. I'm not really sure. And also, we've got this... Um, another thing is that we've got this uh, font, which is probably Times New Roman or something similar. Uh, maybe we can also use another font here too. Uh, what is the usual font that I use here? If I go to the Who section, what is this font? I think it's Ubuntu or Roboto. Try a darker blue, says Tiago. Yeah, probably we need a darker blue. Okay, the font family here is Roboto. And I will try to use this that font family here. So body has font size and also font family of Roboto. I'm pretty sure I don't need to to install Roboto. I think I have it installed on my computer. So is this Roboto or is this Sans Serif? Not really sure that this is Roboto. What happens if I remove Sans Serif? Oh, come on, let me, let me change this thing. Okay, this was not Roboto. Oh, I don't have Roboto. Or maybe I need to place it without... Nope, it's not. Okay, Roboto Google Fonts. Domo arigato, Mr. Roboto. Let's go here. No, this is the thin one. No, let's go with the regular one. Regular, 400. Maybe this looks a bit too thick. Maybe the light one. Let's, let's try with the regular and then let's see. Uh, so, I can select the style and then what happens? When I select the style, I should have... Where, where is that? I don't see it. Okay, now I've got this style. What should I do? Should I download the family? I don't want to download the family, I want to use it. Maybe it's this. Oh, view your selected families, okay. So with this import, now I can import both Orbitron and Roboto at the same time. This is exactly what I wanted. Okay, so instead of using this import, now I can use this other one, which will uh, give me both fonts. And now I can use Roboto sans serif here. I will use also here uh, ethnocentric sans serif. It's always best to have a fallback font when you don't have the the current one. At least it's not going to break. It's just using downgrading gra gracefully to some other font. Okay, this is Roboto. Yeah, I see. Um, okay, so you were you were talking about a, um, a darker blue, and I agree with you. But this blue was light because we had this very dark background in my website. So my curiosity is about what happens if instead I use this kind of background and also this kind of um, uh, semi-transparent card. What happens if I try to use these kind of, uh, uh, of backgrounds and colors? Maybe it will be too fancy, too stupid, it will not look anymore as a certificate, but let's try it out, okay? Uh, so I'm going to open this image in a new tab. I'm going to use this as a background and I'm going to save it. I'm going to put it in images and I'm going to call it background. Maybe it's a really bad idea, 
but we will never know until we see it. Or you can use Comic Sans so everyone will know that we are a joke. Yes, why not? And a bad joke. Okay, so I can try and use the background there. Uh, I can place it probably on the background itself, on the body itself. Uh, so I can say something like, I don't know, background is, uh, background, yeah, background is URL. Is it like that? I don't even remember. Um, let's go to images and then background JPG. And then I want to also put something like no repeat. And there was also some other property that allowed me to stretch. No, not stretch. It was cover, something like that. I don't know. I'm improvising. Okay, it's not working at all. So this means that the background image was is not supposed to be written like this. Um, let's first... Okay, it, it, the problem is with the cover. The problem is with cover. And what if I say background size cover? Is it going to change anything? Mm, yes, it is. It is changing. Okay, so I'm going to do something like this. Background is the URL. And then this will be part of another rule, which is background size. And of course, this all looks like crap. Of course it does. But wait a second. We can do something. Uh, probably. I don't know. Mm, for example, the text is already... Of course, it is not good. Uh, the text should be some sort of whitish, which is not completely white. It's actually BBB. It's a gray because it doesn't want to be hard on your eyes. So we can say uh, color is BBB, BBB, and it's going to change in two. You could have just went with another transparent IC logo for the background. Yes, however, I... Oh, you're talking about the background. Uh, oh, a huge transparent logo. Mm, I don't know if it works. And right now, even the body doesn't work. Maybe I shouldn't put this one here. I should put this in the HTML. I don't even remember where to put these things. Yeah, now it works. Uh, maybe font family and font size should also be placed in the HTML, now that I think about it. Well, it's exactly the same. So this looks bad, I know, but um, let, let's see, let's see and explore. Uh, I don't see the, the, the border there. Um, maybe the border that we created at a certain point, which was this one here, should not be black, it should be like this. Ah, uh, I have to come. Okay, if I want to change these colors easily in the future, this is a good occasion to write some variables. So variables are something like this. I can say outer border color. And this is the declaration of the variable. And I can place the, um, the color as the value. You don't need to specify let, const or var. In SAS, you just specify the variable, uh, you just declare it like this. And now that we've got this variable, I think that we can just use it like this. Uh, you know what? I'm, yeah, okay. Let's see if it works. Yep, it still works. And why do I need this variable? Because I also want to have another variable that is uh, related to this thing here. Uh, we can call it uh, signature border color. And this for now is exactly the same value, but at a certain point we can uh, decide to change it and it will change independently on the outer border color. That's why variables are pretty neat in SAS and also in CSS because we now have CSS variables. Uh, so is this one here? Yep. Now we've got these two variables. What about the compilation? If I compile these variables, they just disappear and the, the values are just placed where they belong. So as you can see, these variables are just a commodity for us 
just something useful for us while we are developing, but they will disappear. Um, we can also say font color, which is BBB BBB. So we can use it here and we can change it later on. Font color. And this changes nothing, of course. Uh, so let's try to put some more color to make it even more stupid. For example, the H2s and H3s here are green, are really green. So we can call it something like uh, subheading color. And the subheading color will be used for everything that is an H2 or an H3, something like this. And okay, this is starting to become really, really colorful, too, too much. In Glorious Academy, I could try to use this, uh, the same effect. As you can see, it's a strange effect because it's a text which has some darker gray on the bottom. And this is not something that you can do in plain CSS. In fact, you can see that there is something else going on here. This was actually pretty difficult to achieve. I don't even remember how I achieved it, but it's a div that contains a span in Glorious. And it also has another span, which is called shade, which is positioned precisely where I want to. So it was pretty difficult to, to achieve exactly the same results. It's not just CSS. And if I want to exactly do the same thing, I can. I don't know if it's really that important. I see that the color is, uh, of course, 666. So the color is some variable called heading color and heading color will be here. Uh, you probably know that 666 or 666, 666 is exactly the same thing. When you have things repeating, you can just call them with three numbers instead of three numbers, uh, instead of six numbers. Okay, Inglorious Academy is too bland right now, so I probably need to do this effect. Let's try to mimic this effect. So the H1 is not just an H1. It's an H1 which has two spans. One is the Inglorious Academy. And the other one contains, well, nothing. It contains a non-blank space. So let's call it like this. A span with a non-blank space. The first one is, well, it has no, no name, but the, one, the other one, I gave it a, a name of a shade, so I probably need to have this class shade. So what, we ha what do we have right now? Did I break anything? No. It's not broken, at least for now. But we've got the span and we've got the shade. So the span, I don't think it has to have anything at all the color, and that's it. But as for the shade, you have a position relative, a margin of dots of minus 1.5 REM00. So this is a margin top. It's just a margin top. No padding, a background of 111, a height, an opacity. It has a lot of stuff here. So you know what? I'm going to just copy it and then we'll see. So the H1 has a child. This child is a shade. The shade has all these properties and maybe some of them are not really that important. Here I can say that the margin top is that one. I don't need to specify both. The padding is zero, but of course, because it's just a span. Display block is interesting because this is a span that should behave as a div, apparently. And the fact that it has a width of 100% is probably also pretty non uninteresting because if it has a display of block of course it has a width of 100% the height is probably very important but it also probably is related to the height of the whole h1 so this is probably not going to work as expected at first mm, yeah almost it's not exactly where i wanted it but it's close so let's see if we can just change it somehow. 
Uh, so the shade is like this. And what about the margin top? Can I just make it less margined? 1.25. 1.25 seems to be right in the middle. I could live with that. Uh, how's it going here? Yeah, it looks, it looks similar. I don't know, it looks exactly in, in the middle. But I don't, I don't know if I really like it that much. I also see that... No, it's fine, it's fine. Uh, another thing is that I think there's some uh, box shadow here or some text shadow going on. Or maybe not. Text shadow, do I have text shadow? No. No, I was dreaming about a text shadow. Okay, we've got also text align center, which is completely useless because we are already in a text align center scenario. Um, is the height really that important? Did we already see that? I want to clean it up a little. So this shade here, what if it doesn't have a height? Oh, okay, now I remember one thing. There's actually a strange effect here because if you carefully look at it, you can see that there is a rectangle showing. And I don't really like this rectangle showing. But there was no way to remove this kind of rectangle. I think that now we've got one thing that we can do. It's called a mask. CSS mask is something that, uh, or clip also, allows you to, well, clip or mask. Uh, clip with a rectangle, clip path, clip inset. L see how Harry Potter is now clipped with even a polygon. But this looks uh, pretty difficult for our purposes. Ooh, even an animated clip. No, this is not exactly what I wanted. I wanted actually to clip with the text. I don't know if this is possible. It probably is, but I'm going to spend too much. Oh, background clip. Oh, web kit background clip text. No idea if this is going to work. Oh, there's also SVG fill, but this is SVG and I don't want the SVG. Is this working for HTML? Well, this is a div. WebKit background clip text. I just want to try it. So if I go here, <clears throat> and I'm going to also make the te the text a little bigger. Sorry for that. If I just now realized it was too small. Uh, so what if I say WebKit? What was that background clip? Or it was just clip? Oh, I don't remember. What's something like this? Okay, <clears throat> this is a property that actually works, but it's not working in our case. So this is not what we wanted. What if I do H1? Not doing anything at all. What if I do it on a span? It's exactly the same thing. So I don't seem to be able to make it work. Maybe it just works with the block, display block. No, not even. So... Uh, I, don't, I don't know how it works. Maybe I should state in Glorious Academy in here. And then I'm able to WebKit. Mm, no, not the same effect that I wanted. But yeah, with some thoughts, maybe I will be able to do this, but not today. I don't, I don't care about this right now. Okay, so this kind of works. Uh, we've got the logo, which is really bad with this white background. But unfortunately, I was never able to create a transparent static logo. I'm able to create a logo like this one, which is not static at all. In fact, it's dynamic. It's a React component. But I'm not too, I'm not able to do a, a transparent background like this one. 
I do have something similar here, but it's it's it just doesn't work. Uh, let me see if I have it anywhere. I don't have it here because here I've got just black and white. And if I try to use the black one, it probably it's probably not the the what we want. It's just not exactly what we want. Oh. Actually, it's pretty similar to what we want because this background is already pretty dark. What if I do Control P? Okay, this is what happens, which is nice. I actually have uh, a screen layout and a print layout which behave pretty differently, but there is something good going on actually. I didn't think it was going to behave like this. So, you know what? First of all, the logo should not be an image. I think it should probably become a div. Uh, I will call it logo. And this image will be put as a background. I will tell you why, of course. So, now I'm going to turn this image into a div with a background. Where's the logo? Media print, frame, h1, shade, h okay, here's the logo. So the logo will be something like this. And we'll have a height and also have a background, which is an image with that URL. Did I copy it? No, of course not. So I have to go back to fol one folder, images, logos, and then black. And I will say no repeat as, as always. I don't know if this is important. I don't even know if background size cover is important, but usually I just put it, hope it hoping it works. And if I now npm run style, this is what I have. This is awful. <laughs> this is exactly not what I wanted. Really awful. I completely destroyed everything. And the reason is that this logo is height of 6rem. Maybe it should have also a width of six REMs. Yes, but the logo is also wrapping everything. This is the problem with my with my code. I created a logo that auto closes itself, but the browser understood that I had to wrap everything inside of this logo, which is completely stupid. So what happens if I instead use it like this? Okay, it's still cover. I will put a width of 6 REMs and I should also OK and now I also have to put it in the middle. How do I put it in the middle? I could probably use this, the usual margin 0 auto. What is that? Margin 0 auto to place it nicely in the middle. Or I can use display flex etc etc but this is probably the easiest way. So now the logo is black and it behaves exactly as before. The only difference is now that I can create a media query for print, which allows me to specify the background image as a different one. So I can do something like this. The background is white for print because it looks better. And of course, I have to put this on the logo rule. I'm pretty sure that this no repeat thing will uh, not help me. So I'm going to say that the background image is this one. If I don't do this, background will override also background size. And I'll have to redefine background size. Instead, here I'm just changing the property background image. And apparently it doesn't need any repeat. So that's fine. Probably the no repeat was also useless in here. Because if we do a background size of cover, this automatically will not repeat anything, I think. So the, back, the, the, the logo now is, is black, but if I print, it's not even there. Awesome! Uh, what, did I got, what did I get wrong? Background image is this URL. Don't you like this URL? It's called white. It's in here. Look how nice it is. Why is it not working? Do I also have to put anything else? I'm going to put also background size cover for... Just to check. 
Nope, still unavailable. Uh, oh, wait a second. I'm afraid that the problem is that I cannot use background images in print layouts. So this was kind of stupid. Uh, background, oh, come on. Background image on print layout. How can I force browsers to print background image in CSS? You have very little control over a browser's printing methods. At most, you can suggest, but if the browser's print settings have don't print background images, there's nothing you can do without rewriting your page to turn the background images into floating foreground images that happen to be behind other content. With Chrome and Safari, you can add the CSS style WebKit print color adjust exact to the element to force print the background color and or image. Okay, what is this thing? Webkit print, WebKit print color adjust. And if you say exact, uh, where this, where should this, okay, you can place this on article, for example, so on a specific element. So what happens if, for example, I place it here? Uh, where's my, okay. Ah, oh, it didn't work. Or maybe I can refresh. Still not working. But I can probably try to put this thing on somewhere else. Maybe I can put it in the certificates. This doesn't change anything here, but on print. Nope. But I've got this one here now. <laughs> okay. So this, this strange thing now appears so it should have worked but it's not working um i'm starting to have no clue on how to resolve this thing is the image the proper one yeah i think so why is it not going to use this exact thing background color ee it's not working on firefox and explorer or firefox for android Hey, I'm going to say hello, I'm going to code. Hi, Deity! I, I contacted those companies that I'm in touch with, but uh, they're not looking for a, um, an intern, I'm sorry for that. And they also have this language barrier. But uh, I was thinking about, well, there is a, a startup that I used to collaborate with, which is called Vlog. It's based in Nice. I did two courses for them, and I really love them. I like the, the people and the way they work. Uh, I saw the careers and uh, they are not looking for, a, for an intern, but maybe if you propose yourself to them and you say that I'm sending you to them, maybe they could consider a very clever intern as you. So yeah, you can try with Vlog, they are French. Il parle français. Pardon for my French, I completely lost it. I used to speak French much better than English when I was young. Okay, um, so let's go back to our certificates. Uh, this is not going to work. And I, another thing that I really don't like is my signature not standing up properly because there is some white border happening here, which makes it very difficult to read. Also, there's another thing that I wanted to add here. Um, so, wait a second, uh, there's a problem with the background. This is not going to work. So, I have to probably roll back. This must be an image. It must have a source that is images, logos, black. And I will also add the alt. And this is not going to have the background. Uh, I can probably remove everything apart from the width or the height, which is exactly the same. Uh, I can remove also this one. And I hope that this is exactly the same as before. But now if I print, the logo is black. And I don't really like the black logo here. I would love to have it white. I don't know if I can change the source of the image in print layout. Pretty sure I cannot. Change image SRC print layout can you can you can you no this is javascript no need scripts only css 
So I've got picture, picture mobile, image full display none. Ooh, okay. This is actually pretty clever. You know what? I'm going to try this one, but after the coffee break, because it's already 12.04 my time. So see you at 12.09, right? See you later. Where is that? Bye. A few moments later, back again, <laughs> I had a small snack break actually. I hope that you're eating anything. 
Um, so Tiago was suggesting one thing and I overlooked it. I'm sorry. Do you ever, do you ever try to remove the white or black background from the IC logo? Yes, I tried and I failed. Um, I can show you what happens. If I, uh, if I open um, an image editor like GIMP or GIMP, I never understood how to, to, to call it. And I open that logo. Uh, let me see projects. Oh, this is going to be pretty difficult. Glorious Cutters. Um, I'm going to, with the logos that I have here. Uh, where is that? Images, logos, and then I'm going to use either black or white. It's, uh, it doesn't make much difference. Let's see if I can, yeah, I can open both. So one cool feature that you have in image editors is something like um, alpha to, no, color to alpha, something like this. It's in the transparency section. So probably I can see it, where is that? Oh my God, where is that? Colors, uh, brightness constraints. Oh, come on, where is it? Oh, color to alpha, fine. <laughs> You see, if I say that white should become transparent, this is what you get. It's too transparent because it removes the whiteness from the logo itself too. If instead I select with the magic wand all the whiteness and I remove it like this, well, this logo has too much whiteness to be properly visible on a dark background. So it, this is not real transparency. And the same goes with black. If I now remove the black part, this is way too black to be shown on a, on a uh, lighter background. And if instead I try to do the same thing as before, so I try to do color to alpha, and this time I'm selecting the black instead of white, uh, this is too transparent. So as you can see, there's no, no good way to remove the transparency from my logo, at least. I tried multiple times, but the effect is different. It's, it's not what I want. Probably the, the best effect is this one, and I can try to use it. So I will try to, oh, I'll try to use this one. So I'm um, going to put it here. Uh, where's that? Academy. Glorious Portfolio, um, Easter Special, Certificate of Survival, then we go to Images, then we go to Logos, and I will call this one Transparent. Okay, then I can just use it here. I'll use the Transparent logo and see what happens. Well, this actually looks pretty good. <laughs> On the dark background, this looks exactly the same as before, which is awesome. And if I print it, well, it actually looks pretty good. Okay, Tiago, you solved my problem. You solved a problem that I have for the past five or six years. <laughs> you, just, uh, you just pushed me to try once more, and now apparently it works. I like it like this. Yeah, why not? I don't have to do any fancy stuff. It just works. This is so awesome. Okay, so I'm pretty sure still that, well, the certificate in web layout is completely stupid. I cannot show a certificate like this one. And also, I think that the blue is still too, too light. You're right, Tiago. I should probably go with a darker blue. Uh, this one here is way too light. And there's even a lighter one if I hover on a button. In fact, if I say hover on this button, now I'm not even using this color. I'm using another color, which is... I don't know. It doesn't say. Where's the, where's the hover color here? Or is it going to use this background color? No. Oh, there's also a background color to be used. Where's the style for the... Oh, come on. I cannot see where is the style for the hovered button. 
Don't see it. Oh, brow, it's, it's just a filter. A filter of brightness, 125%. You know what? This kind of filter could be useful for us too. Because if I want a darker background, I can just, instead of uh, creating my own color based on the current one, I can probably just make it lighter. So instead of brightness 125, I can probably do something like, I don't know, brightness 50%. What is this thing? <laughs> this is not what I wanted. This is uh, reducing the brightness of the whole frame, not of the back of the border only. So no, cannot use filter. Um, I should probably take this thing here and look for some hacks to RGBA. Let's do the let's use a hex color tool. So I want this color, and this color apparently is. 66 154 2391 maybe i can remove some transparency mm, not really sure about that um but now we've got variables and we can use those in here so i can say for example outer border color is this color here now and let's see how it changes too much too much transparency, but still, it looks like a dark color. And what happens in uh, print layouts? It looks like a more washed out color, which is not really that bad. I didn't want this color to be so bright. Uh, maybe the problem is not with lightness, it's brightness, which is slightly different. So what about 75? I don't know. 75 or maybe 66 we could try with 66 and in between 667 which is the usual rounding of uh, two thirds okay this works pretty good and here it works good too yeah i think that it could work maybe this blue is already is still too bright and i could use the same the same shade of blue if i want to like uh, this yeah this is fine another thing that I would like to add and then we can probably stop with that is to add this uh, semi-transparent card uh, this looks also really nice I don't know if uh, if it makes sense in here so if everything is here the certificate has all this stuff uh, I should put everything inside of a card. So inside of the certificate, I can put a card, another div, which I'll call card. And the card doesn't change anything at all, for now at least, and that's good. Uh, so now I would say that the certificate should have less padding and the card should have more should have more padding. I'm going to move some of the padding from the certificate to the card. So where's the certificate? Here it is. And the certificate has itself something called a card. The certificate will have a padding of uh, let's say one REM and the card will have a padding of two REMs. But also, the card will have this box shadow and also this background color. And let's see what happens. Okay, it's very subtle, but there is some uh, grayness in this card. I don't know if I really like it or not. Maybe I would add some more padding to the certificate. Yeah, something like this. I see too much this, uh, this square, this rectangle. I don't like it, but still. And what happens if I instead print? Okay, the print has box shadow. Nah, I don't think that the box shadow is good there. No. Probably this works only for the non-print layout. I don't know. I don't know. It's 
pretty much the same. Uh, can I turn this thing into a PDF without the print layout? I'm not really sure I can. No, don't think so. Pages all, more settings. Is there anything that I can do here? So for example, margins none. Ooh, okay, this is better. Scale default. Well, scale I would like to be 100%, but it, this is already 100%. Options, background graphics. Ooh, wait a second. I can print the whole thing in PDF exactly like I created it. Hmm, this changes everything. So I can decide if I want it like this or if I want it like this. This is cool. Um, still have to decide about it. I don't know. What, what do you think about it? If you had to share a PDF, would you like to have it shared like this? Which probably makes it more serious and authentic. Or would you like to have it like this? Which makes it stand out more, especially on the LinkedIn feed. This is up to you. I can give you both maybe both versions and you'll decide what you want to do with it. The real problem that I have with this is the signature. I don't like the transparency that I see in the signature. And probably I can try to do the same thing that I did before with, with GIMP. But I'm afraid that with the signature is, uh, it's less immediate. Because here I have to remove that kind of white and it's not going to work well. Let's find out. So take the survival images. Uh, my signature is this one. And as you can see, there was already some uh, transparency removed, but it didn't really work as expected. So what happens if I instead remove the whiteness from this? Pretty sure it doesn't work well. Serious and authentic all the way, but why put all the other work on if it's not going to be used? Uh, because I'm just <laughs> for no reason at all. It's just because I I don't know what to do during this uh, this Saturday. So I'm putting the effort just because because we are learning for the sake of learning. Okay, now the signature is completely unintelligible because when I remove all the whiteness. This is what we have, uh, what we came up with. So, nope, this is not good enough. Maybe I can try to colorize this thing, or uh, I don't know, brightness contrast, a little more brightness. Mm, mm, not really going to do. Okay, the contrast is a little better if I increase it. Not so much for the brightness. What if I say brightness is, oh, okay, this is too bright. 50? Okay, 50 is too much. I, I don't know what I'm doing. Still, I'm, I believe that this blue signature is way too invisible on a dark background. What happens on a, instead of a light background? What if I remove the background graphics here? Yeah, this still looks good. So bottom line, I'm not really sure I want to remove that uh, white because otherwise it's not going to, to look good. This is awful, but at least it looks, oh, come on. But at least it looks something, looks like something. And still, this is, uh, is working pretty well. I don't know if I want to keep this box shadow. Um, it doesn't bother me too much. Maybe I will keep it. Yeah, the problem I have is with this um, with this um, green green color because the green color has the purpose of being well neon like in this kind of background. But if I as soon as I remove the background from here and maybe also the where is that maybe also the background color from here. This becomes more bland. I don't know, it's still not that bad. Hmm. It looks pretty good, actually. You know what? I think that's, yeah, we can keep it. 
So yeah, all my attempts were just uh, yeah attempts at creating something that, well, uh, you know what? You can have this as the web version, which you can show by just sharing a link. And then you have the printed, well, the PDF version, which will look like this. You can have both. So that's could, that could be a good reason to have wasted or spent so much time in doing all this stuff. Then I want to also welcome the suggestion by Bobby. So presented by is actually more important than is actually less important than stating the name. So what happens if we now, uh, well, do exactly the opposite? Index.html has this presented by, which will be a paragraph, and my name will be an h3. Is this going to be better? Probably yes, but not on this one. Uh, held on Twitch, this is also pretty bland. And from October, blah, 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 this is a text that is too long to put it as uh, a gray thing. So, I don't know, maybe you can just say from October, uh, and uh, and then just, I don't know, Twitch. Oh, oh come on. Twitch.tv slash Inglorious Coders. Does it look good like this? I'm um, also gonna put an at symbol here. I don't know, something like this. Yeah. I don't know if this should be bigger or I don't know. And I would also like to put something here as, I don't know, as maybe Tiago's signature or uh, some stamp that I do not have right now. Uh, but for now, I don't know. I will keep, I will leave it blank. Maybe you can put the Twitch logo. We can put the Twitch logo like this. I'm going to do it and then remove it right away because I'm pretty sure that it's not good. But let's try, let's try. Um, so let's save this image. Save image as. I'm going to put it here, uh, Twitch. Well, this is a logo for Twitch, so I'll put it here. Nah, this is my logos. So I'm gonna put it right here. Nope, please. Listen to me. Okay, now that we've got the Twitch logo, I can probably do the same thing as I did here for my signature. So I'm going to place this thing here. Uh, this is the images Twitch. This is Twitch. Nope. And the ID will be Twitch again. But probably this has a, almost exactly the same features as, as my signature. If it's like so, we can create a class of signature because this looks like the Twitch signature. And instead of using the ID signature, I can probably use, where's that? Class signature will have a position absolute, top minus four REM, fair width, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe the height should, have, should be also uh, changed, but let's see what happens by default. Ooh, <laughs> a little too big, maybe. Just a little, maybe. So what is happening with this image? Why is it so big? Because nobody is telling the image to be smaller. And what about the signature? Same thing. So the, apparently the signature here has, oh, but wait a second. Uh, it's not even, I forgot a dot. Okay, much better for the signature, but not for Twitch. Uh, the signature right now has a top, a left, a width. This width of 15 REM doesn't seem to be working for the Twitch here. And the reason is probably because I misspelled something. This has a class of signature. This also has a class of signature. So these two seem equal. 
Oh, but this signature is only the one on the right. Instead, I have to put this signature rule inside of every div. Is it this one? Yep. So probably this work will work better. But not really. Okay, here's Twitch. I see it on the top. And it's seen it on the top because position relative is only on the right element. And instead, now I want the position uh, relative to be for all of my divs inside of the flex container. Now I see Twitch working. But it's taking too much space. Way too much space. So actually Twitch should be quite smaller. And probably the thing that I can do is instead of specifying the width of this element, I can specify the height of the element. So instead of width uh, 15 REM, I can say height is 2 REM. 3? 3 is fine. Yeah, 3 REM. So the signature will not be width 15, but high 3 REM. So this way I'm sure that both of my pictures have the same height height and it's not really that important instead how much they are wide maybe one is shorter maybe one is larger I don't really care about that okay I don't know if uh, putting the logo twitch makes this thing less uh, I don't know less reliable but okay I think it's fine as a first attempt and then maybe later on we can continue working on that uh, we can work on that outside of the lesson, maybe uh, on Discord, maybe on some other private chats. You decide. I will stop here for now. I think it looks good enough. And we spent already, how much? Two hours and a half to do this? And it's just plain HTML and CSS. So, I like it. It's good enough. Just going to clean up some things. For example, there was this uh, zip file that wasn't supposed to be there. I can remove the logo, uh, the black and the white one, because we're using the transparent currently, and it works like a charm. I I cannot Im I couldn't imagine that we had this thing that just works. So I'm going to call this logo. I'm going to put it here. Going to remove the folder logos just to clean up things. And now I need to point to the logo instead of the logos transparent. We just have one logo and it's the logo. Uh, don't think that we updated anything in the SAS file, but probably there is some comments here that I want to remove. So I'm going to remove this comment. I'm going to remove this one too. And what else? No, nope, nothing else. Okay. Um, let me see if everything still works or if I broke anything. So this seems to be working. It's pretty huge actually. And, but this is because I said that, no, just because it's like this, uh, only on print layout, it will be an A4. So this has become big because of the content, not because of anything else, which is fine. And as print layout, it's still working pretty well. Okay, I'm happy with the results. Fine, we've got our inglorious certificate. I'm really happy. So I'm going to also commit and push everything. Uh, I didn't use the italic ethnocentric. And since we are not using it, I think I'm going to remove it. Well, all the other fonts were actually included just like um, j just as a reference as an import okay now we're done so adding everything create a certificate of survival this is our exercise about html and css that's it for today about css and html then now if you want to we can have a look at some uh, JavaScript instead. What do you think about? Let's do some a new folder called JS. 
And here we're going to do some JavaScript. I also want to rem to close the live server. So what can we do here? Uh, I know that Bobby worked a little bit on linked lists. Linked lists are probably a very tough topic. I don't know if you guys want to have a look at linked lists right now. There was a there, there were a couple of um, yeah of, of homeworks that I asked you last time, which were a continuation of what we did uh, last Saturday. So for example, let me see factorial. There was the iterative, the recursive one. We talked about garbage collection, about linked lists. Yeah, this was the how do I get a reference to the previous element? Os? What? Was this if, maybe? How do I get a reference to the previous element? What, what was that, Os? <laughs> I don't know, as I can change it. I don't remember why I, there, there's an Os there. How do I get a reference to the previous element? I, I don't know. Weren't there two exercises left on Wednesday? Yes, if you want, you can also see the exercises on Wednesday. Uh, oh, that was just so, so I can change its reference. Okay, that was just a, a typo about it. Yeah, okay, we can do some um, uh, those remaining exercises on the on the tutorial if you want to. So we're not, we don't have to do it next Wednesday. But the problem is, what are we going to do next Wednesday then? <laughs> but yeah, you can do this. Let's have a look. Um, so where was that? It was it in global hoisting, uh, scheduling. I don't even remember where we were. So let's go to hoisting. We already saw this and there was just a summary. Then we've got the globals object. It was nothing. Then we got the named function object. Well, we can do the linked lists and homework. Yeah. In fact, I think that we can do this one. Uh, did we did okay? Uh, I remember to have seen this one, but maybe it was just by myself because the algas need a bit more explanation. Okay, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, right now, I have no idea where we were, so I'm sorry for that. But I'm working on three projects in parallel, and now I'm starting to l lose track of where we are. Let's see this one. Maybe it was here. Those two exercises that were left. Our counters independent, counter object, function in if, some with closures. I remember this one. Then is variable visible. There's a pitfall. The filter through function. I remember we did this one. So this is the one that we are supposed to do now. Sort by field, right? We get an array of objects to sort. The usual way to do that would be this one. Can we make it even less verbose like this? Blah, blah, blah. So I'm pretty sure that we never saw this one, right? So let's try it. Okay, so I'm going to do... Um, I'm going to remove this JS. I'm just going to create a new folder called tasks. And this is a new file, which is sort by... I don't remember. What, what was that? Sort by filter? Sort by field. Sorry, sort by field. Okay, sort by field. We've got an array of objects to sort, and this is the array which I'm just going to copy right away in here. So let users is an array that has name John, age 20, surname Johnson, name Pete, age 18, surname Peterson, name Ann, age 19, surname Hathaway. The usual way to do that, to sort the items based on their property, is something like this. Users.sort, given A and B, and it will, it will tell if A.name is greater than B.name. In that case, it will tell 1, otherwise it'll say minus 1. And if I want to sort by age, it will be exactly the same. The only thing that changes is this... Uh, the access to the property dot name and dot age. So can we make it even less verbose like this by using a function called by field in which we specify the name of the field that we want to compare. 
So instead of writing a function, just put by field field name. Write the function by field that can be used for that. Well, this is very, very interesting because it's uh, descending from the concept of currying that we were already talking about last Wednesday. Currying is just the process of having a function of, uh, for example, two parameters, like sum. This is a function of two parameters. And transforming it into a function that takes only one parameter. And that function will not return a result because it needs another parameter. So it will return another function that takes the second parameter. So function sum can also be written as sum of a which takes only one parameter, a, and it will return a new function that can also be an anonymous function if I want to, and that can take a second parameter, and the second parameter will make it uh, possible to perform all the calculation. The difference is, especially on how I call them, if I invoke this sum, it's sum of two and three, and then sum of... Uh, two and four and then sum of two and whatever you want of course it must not be always two but in this case if i want to sum two with other things i have to declare two every single time sum of two and three sum of two and four sum of two and seven and if this two is already the result of some calculations well then i have to store the result of those calculations somewhere else or i have to do the same calculations over and over again and in this case instead i can use sum like this sum of two is giving me a function and then with this function i can immediately invoke that function also on three and i can do the same with all the other numbers so as you can see the difference seems just to have some uh, a, a pair of googly eyes instead of uh, one huge eye with two pupils but it's actually slightly different in the way I can use this function because for example I can cache the first function I can say const sum2 is equal to sum of 2 so now I know that the parameter a is 2 and will always be 2 if I invoke this function and then I can ask sum2 to be invoked on 3 and then on 4 and then on 7 and as you can see I'm keeping one part of the function there and I'm applying the same function, the same partial function to uh, different parameters. This is what we can leverage when creating the sort function here. If I want to sort the users, I can do users.sort and then given A and B, I want to sort them based on the, I don't know, the name, A.name is greater than B.name then return one otherwise return minus one or i want to um i want to sort these things by age or by surname but this dot name is now hardwired in the sort function how do i make things that are hardwired instead more parametric well i can do this with functions so instead of uh, placing this function here i can instead uh Let's do one step. Let's create the comparator function. So function comparator is a function that given a and b will return exactly this thing here. Uh, you know what? I'm going to use the arrow function notation. Const comparator is equal to this thing here. This is my comparator function. And I can just remove this anonymous function here, I can replace it with the comparator, the reference to comparator. This is not going to work because if you remember, arrow functions are not subject to function hoisting, which means that this function was declared after it was used and it will give me an error. So watch out because I have to post, uh, I have to put this function before using it if I keep it like this. But I'm not going to keep it like this. So let's keep it for now at line 9 even if it uh, does create an error what i want to do now is to have this function be more parametric on the on the property on the field that i want to inspect and then i want to compare so what i can do is i can wrap this function inside of another function the function will be called as they say by field 
function by field takes the field that I want to inspect and compare and this function will return this other function so if I'm using it like this uh, by field is just by field but I have to also open and close a couple of parentheses because I have to invoke the by field function so it will return the actual function that I want to use as a comparator you remember the comparator is this function here so if I wrap it inside of a function that returns a function I have to invoke the by field function this way it will return me that function not invoking that function just returned and why do I need this function to be to wrap the comparator function because this way I can use um, a, a parameter that allows me to specify which field I want to use instead of having it hard-coded in the function itself in the in the comparator function so instead of a dot name I can use square bracket notation here to say a of whatever field was passed by outside and the same goes here for of course so now that I have this function that returns a function, I can say by field name, and this will generate a function, a comparator function, that will compare the names of my objects. And if I do exactly the same, but with by field, not boo field, by field age, this will create a function, a comparator function, that uses the age field to be compared so that's why I need to also open those parentheses I have to invoke the by field function here I always told you you should always pass a reference to the function to the comparator function yes that's true but the by field is not the comparator function by field is the function that returns the comparator function so you want to invoke it in order to keep this first parameter aside just like we we kept the two parameter aside in the sum function and then we can apply the same parameter over and over again with every other parameter like three four and seven this is exactly the same thing does it make sense i know it's quite strange and uh, difficult to grasp at, at first but also note that this is already um, a pretty advanced concept that I usually explain not even in my 15th lesson, but in my 20th lesson. My 20th lesson has just two slides, which I usually leave optional. One is about curring, which is exactly what we are doing right now. And the second one is composition, which is what Bobby calls the pipe operator or the pipe function. Bobby says, is curing used a lot? Yes, if you like Indian food, but also uh, it's very, uh, it's starting to get quite useful and quite common, especially when you are dealing with React applications. Curring is, makes your code very clean and uh, much more reusable just like function composition so we are witnessing recently in the past few years uh, some sort of revival of functional programming functional programming seemed to be just a nice looking uh, exercise but it's not it's actually very useful very interesting and we are starting to use it a lot in fact one thing that I can show you, for example, uh, wait a second, I'm cleaning up all my tabs. Um, one thing that I can show you, for example, can I, can I close this one? No. Um, one thing that I can show you, for example, is that if you use the Redux library by Facebook, you will see that, well, I, I don't know if uh, we are able to, to, to understand things here. Um, we can see that Redux is all about creating functions and the functions are called reducers which should remind you of the reduce array method and we also have callback functions here and maybe we are also able to see other cool thing 
uh, other cool things like uh, let me see if I can show you blah 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 no uh, I don't know if I can you probably don't know anything about what is Redux and uh, how does it work and it's not really that important right now but if you look up the code even without understanding it you see that it uses everything that we saw so far it uses objects it uses arrays it uses array concatenation slicing pushing so whatever we we saw so far seems like just nothing and you should uh, use very uh, other very complex things when uh, writing real life applications but no it's actually using objects arrays array methods and uh, and composition and currying all the way uh, I cannot seem to, to find let me see like this okay Redux is a library that we can use and with that library you have a function called compose compose is what you call pipe so that's why uh, I'm going to show you what piping is but it's not really that important to know how to implement a pipe function it's very interesting you can say but it's not that important to you to know how to build a pipe function because usually the libraries and the frameworks that you use uh, already provide a compose or a pipe function for example Redux provides a function called compose that takes a series of functions and it composes them together so you already have it another library that you that, that, that provides this thing is another by uh, react by Facebook which is called recompose not this one <laughs> nope recompose is another function that leverages a lot the concept of uh, function composition and in fact if you look at the source code well if you look at the documentation on how to use recompose ooh, there is a function called compose which allows you to uh, compose functions together so you don't need to uh, implement it yourself and I'm pretty sure that the compose function that I see here is implemented in a very very similar way or maybe identical to the compose function that we have in Redux these are two libraries but both provide the same compose function another place where you see the compose function or the pipe function is in a library made by Microsoft which is called RxJS I think it's called pipe and let's look for a pipe here everything can be a pipe here uh, yep if you look at this you can see that this object which is an observer can pipe multiple operations together which is exactly the same thing as composing so is curring used a lot you can live without curring but you would lose a lot if you don't know it and many many developers are starting to understand it and appreciate it and use it in their code base how is it more useful to use a library than vanilla if all the concepts are taken from plain js looks like it just saves you some writing exactly that's it there is a very important principle which is well don't reinvent the wheel and this is really important as a concept in programming whenever you try to recreate something by yourself you are reinventing the wheel and when reinventing the wheel you are not leveraging the know-how of the of, of humanity so maybe you want sometimes to reinvent the wheel because you want to have your own custom implementation of something or you just don't trust the 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 people that built that library and you want to have full control on that library yourself and that's fine but if you think about it in in life in real life you are relying on many people and you have to trust them for example i'm currently speaking from an apartment and the apartment was built by someone and i really hope that that someone did their homework well and this apartment will not fall apart at a certain point 
also because I paid it a lot. <laughs> so I don't want to waste my life and my money. But I'm never going to build a house by myself. It's too much. Maybe I'm not going to do a better job than the engineer or the architect that created this building. The same goes with technology. I'm currently using Ubuntu, which is an operating system created by many, many people, which are not necessarily smarter than me, but they are specialized more on some things like operating systems. If I had to build an operating system, system from scratch by myself, it would take a lot of time and I would probably make a crappy operating system. Uh, you can. There's Linux from scratch if you want to create your own operating system, but I don't want to. I tried using Gen 2 or Gen 2 for some time, which is not Linux from scratch, but it's uh, about all about compiling your kernel and compiling all your packages so your packages and your kernel are optimized for your machine. But then who cares about optimization? I didn't really care about all that optimization. And in fact, my machine was suffering a lot from all the compiling that I was doing. So nowadays I prefer something that I can just use and give for granted that it works. The same goes with JavaScript libraries and frameworks. Yes, you can start building everything from scratch, but if you have to write complex things, you don't want to reinvent the wheel over and over again. You just want to rely on some building blocks that were created by someone else. But it's still a good thing to know and understand how some things, works, uh, some things work. So it's uh, still a good thing that we can do to try and create our own compose function. First of all, we want to understand why we need a compose function. How is it? Uh, well, we don't need a compose function, but it's actually pretty nice to, to see and to use. So we can see the problem in not using the compose function and then we can try to implement one compose function ourselves and then maybe once we understand the reason why and how to implement it, from the next project on, we can just use the compose function made by someone else. I think this is a good plan. I'm, I don't know if you agree with me. But before uh, doing the, um, the compose function, let's see the solution of this. By field, given the field name, is going to return a function, which is the comparator, which makes the field name, well, parametric. Army of functions. And this is the last exercise. Army of functions. The following code creates an array of shooters. Every function is meant to output its number, but something is wrong. So this is a function, make army, that has an array of shooters, and it does let i is equal to zero, and while i is less than 10, it creates let shooter as a function that alerts i, and then sh pushes this function, shooter, in the array of shooters, and then increases i a plus plus. So, they could have created this as a for loop, but they wanted to make it as a while loop, and that's fine. Uh, then it returns the array of shooters, and when you, um, when you invoke make army, this army is actually just the array of shooters that is going to be returned. So army is an array, and if you say army of zero, you get the first element in the array, which is a function, a shooter function, but if you invoke the shooter function, it says 10, not zero. I wanted those shooters to have their own version of i. Instead, every shooter seems to have the number 10 as their number. So why do all the shooters show the same value? Fix the code so that they work as intended. So I'm going to copy all this code here. Army of functions. New file, army of functions, JS, and this is our army. So if I ins I want to console log this, this thing here. I'm going to do a trick. I'm going to select multiple lines together, and then I'm going to console log all three at the same time. How did I do that? It's the Alt key, at least for uh, in my computer. I can do Alt and click on multiple things 
and I will have the cursor being placed in all the places that I clicked. Or I can use the Alt Shift and then click, which will add the cursor in all the range from the start to the, to the end. So this is uh, pretty useful if you want to repeat the same kind of code over and over in, the, in multiple lines. So what if I now execute this thing? I have to go to tasks and then I have to do node army of functions and it's not working because there's an alert which I didn't remember. So there's no need to do an, a console log here. I got it completely wrong. Uh, because there's, the, the, the console log was already there, it was just a, an, an alert. So I'm going to remove these three and let's go, let's try again. Okay, I see that all three shooters are telling me 10. Why is it, why is it 10? Well, this exercise, I think it's very, very similar to another exercise that we did last Wednesday. In fact, this function is dependent on the value of i, but the value of i is not a parameter of the function, it is taken from outside, right? So I'm pretty sure that when you invoke the function, the function will just use the current value of i, the latest value of i, and since i started with 0 and then it incremented until it reached 10, then, after I invoke those functions, those functions will rely on the latest value of i, which is now 10 at the end of the loop. So what I have to do is instead try to pass the current value of i inside of the shooter and use that value of i. Uh, how can I do this? Maybe I could probably... I could try to use a local variable that will use that same value and we'll keep it like that or um, i don't know eh? i have no idea how to solve this um i'm just reasoning uh, out loud so i have this i which is incremented but every time i uh, create a shooter i want the i to be somehow fixed and to be passed in here so maybe I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a stupid thing. But what if I say, for example, what if I use an immediately invoked function expression? I want to immediately, uh, that's probably stupid, but I'm going to immediately invoke this function, which, no, probably not. I was trying to do something like this. It, it, take i as a parameter and now you have it as i. But this is going to print everything immediately. Not even. Yeah, this is going to print everything immediately because it's an immediately invoked function expression. So this is not going to work. I'm not saying that the shooter is a function. I'm saying that the shooter is the result of invoking this function. So this is not what we want. Uh, but the thing that I had in mind was something like this. It was an anonymous function that, given the i, is going to return the function that given the i, etc., etc. But I think this is exactly the same thing as not using the immediately invoked function execution. So, uh, immediately invoked function expression. So, still not working. And now it's going to turn and to return undefined for some reason. What am I? Didn't I just? What is happening here? Uh, isn't this exactly the same as before? Why is it saying undefined three times? Uh, did I copy badly? Oh, because function of i, of course. Function of i will actually uh, return undefined because i was undefined. Yandros the mad. Oh, do you not use the arrow function notation on purpose? Um, yes, in this case, I'm not using it on purpose because the... Uh, well, the, the exercise was using the not the arrow function. I could use the arrow function, and in fact, when I have to create an anonymous function expression like this one, I usually use an arrow function. And if you prefer it, I do, we can turn it into an arrow function. This, however, 
doesn't change the output. We've got some wrong code in here and we have to find the problem and find the solution to it. The solution is not turning the function expression into an error function. The solution is how, somehow trying to uh, fix the current value of i so the shooter will use that current value of i instead of using another one. Maybe we can use a cache. Maybe you can say, hey, j for this shooter in particular is the current value of i, then I'm going to use j, and then I can still increment i, but j will stay there. Maybe this will just do the trick, which it does, <laughs> okay. So as you can see, the solution is actually pretty easy. Well, not easy, it's, out, it's hard, but it's simple. You don't want to uh, make the shooter function be tied to a changing value. You want to store the current value of i and use that value for the shooter. And in the meantime, you can still increase the current value of i. So now the shooters will not depend on i, which is changing, but they will be dependent on the value of j, which is never changing. It's only assigned once and then it stays the same. So I think that could be a good solution. Let's see how they solved it. Let's examine what exactly happens inside make army and the solution will become obvious. Oh, Yando the Mad says, does passing i as the arrow function parameter works? Okay, so if I put i in here, so is this what you were thinking about? The problem here is very similar to what we had before. This function is a function that takes i and logs i. So now that we've got the array of shooters in place and they are returned from the make army function, I can ask the first shooter to shoot, but the shooter doesn't have an i to shoot. If I place i in here, it means that I expect the shooter to shoot a number that I pass, like 42. In fact, the first shooter is now shooting 42. But this is not what we wanted. Apparently the exercise was supposed to store the current value. And when I say shoot, it shoots the current value, not the value that I pass as parameter. That's why placing i as parameter is not going to work and not placing the i as parameter is also not going to work because we incur in this kind of a strange bug in which all the shooters now are printing 10 instead of their own value, the current value of i. So what is the reason? Uh, we already mentioned it, but we're going to also read what the tutorial says. So the make army function does this it creates an empty array of shooters let shooters is equal to array empty array then it fills it with functions via shooters push function in the loop so every element is a function so the resulting array looks exactly like this it's an array that now contains 10 uh 10 functions 10 anonymous functions that all alert i and then the array is returned from the function so this is the 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 behavior of this make army function just spread out we've got the array of shooters at the end we are returning the shooters and in this while loop we're just pushing all those functions that just console log i or alert i in our case um 10 times then later the call to any member for example army of five invoking the function will get the element army of five from the array which is a function and calls it it invokes the nth element of the array as if it was a function because it is a function now why do all such functions show the same value which is 10 that's because there's no local variable i inside of shooter functions when such a function is called it takes i from its outer lexical environment then what will be the value of i if we look at the source the source had this while loop which started with i is equal to zero it stops when i is 10 and it increments every, si every time the value of i. We can see that all shooter functions are created in the lexical environment of make army function. But when army of 5 is called, make army has already finished its job and the final value of i is 10, while stops at i is equal to 10. I don't like the fact that they are calling this uh, lexical environment. I don't like 
how it sounds. It looks too convoluted. So I usually try to explain this myself, not speaking about lexical environment. I'm, all, I'm just trying to, uh, to, to make it understandable to me at least, as this function depends on a parameter. Well, it depends on a variable that is not a parameter. If it depended on a, ver on a parameter, then there's no issue. But this function is actually depending on an outer variable, a variable that was defined outside of this function, even outside of the loop in this case. And as soon as I invoke the function, the function will actually use the latest value of this variable. So the variable is i is equal to zero. It then increments, it increments, increments until it becomes i is equal to 10. Then only at the end, I'm invoking this function and this function will just use the current value of i, which is 10. This is the reason why it doesn't work. Um, is there any other? No, okay. Uh, so the thing that we have to do is instead to make sure that the shooter function uses a value that is not going to change over time. Uh, i is going to change over time and will become 10. But if I instead declare a variable here, let's call it j, which is equal to i, well, this, as you know, uh, is a primitive value. i is a number, it's a primitive value. And j, since it's uh, assigned to another primitive value, is it, it is also a primitive value. And why do I stress too much, uh, that much on primitive values? Because primitive values are passed and copied uh, by value and not by reference, which means that j is a copy of i. If i is 5, then j is another, another variable that has exactly the same value, 5. But even if i changes and becomes 6, then j will stay 5. And this is what we care about. If j stays 5, this exa is exactly what we want the shooter to print, In, even if i is changing. So we can see that, yeah, I already told this. As a result, all shooter functions get the same value from the outer lexical environment, and that is the last value, i is equal to 10. So all the shooters will alert i, but i was outside of the scope of the function, of the scope of the loop at least. So i is 10 for all of them. As you can see above, on each iteration of a while block, a new lexical environment is created. So to fix this, we can copy the value of i into a variable within the while block, like this, which is exactly the same solution that I showed you. So you copy the, val the current value of i into a variable j. The variable j is different from i because it doesn't change and it lives in the scope of the while loop. So it means that the j will always be different for every single shooter. Here, let j is equal to i declares an iteration local variable j and copies i into it. It copies the value. It's not a reference to the same value because we're dealing with primitive types. Primitives are copied by value, so we actually get an independent copy of i belonging to the current loop iteration. The shooters work correctly because the value of i now lives a little bit closer, not in make army lexical environment, but in a lexical environment that corresponds to the current loop iteration. Now if we alert j, j is different from ev for every iteration in the loop. j is 0, j is 1, j is 2, j is 10, and it's not always the latest value which is 10. Such a problem could also be avoided if we used for in the beginning like this. So, oh, that's the reason why they use the while loop instead of the for loop. If we use the for loop, then i would be uh, local to the current iteration. So that's another good reason to avoid using the while loop and just use the for loop, because in the while loop, i is global compared to the iteration. Instead, in the for loop, i is local to the current iteration. So I can just remove this thing here and have for let i, letty, for let i is equal to zero, i is less than 10, i, yeah, i plus plus, and I can remove the i plus plus in here too. And I just do console log of i, and this works exactly the same as using that local j. So as you can see, 
while by using the while loop i was over complicating things and i was also introducing a very subtle bug so that's why we need to uh, to learn very well the fundamentals and also do these exercises because i would never have come up with this kind of situation so thanks a lot javascript.info for pointing this out uh, that's essentially the same with the for loop because for on each iteration generates a new lexical environment with its own variable i so shooter generated in every iteration references its own i from that very iteration now as you've put so much effort into reading this and the final recipe is so simple just use for you may wonder was it worth that well, if you could easily answer the question, you wouldn't read the solution. So hopefully this task must have helped you to understand things a bit better. I think it did. Besides, there are indeed cases when one prefers while to for and other scenarios where such problems are real. Okay, so that was really interesting. Uh, we don't have any more exercises on old var, uh, global objects, nope maybe some exercises on the name function expression or how's it called but i don't really i don't really care about this and as you can see this exercise is also in importance too so it's not really that important um i don't think i want to do exercises on this topic because we already said that the function object itself is not really that important as a concept at least for a basic uh programming uh, course uh, I will never using the function object, so I pro I'm I'm pretty confident that you don't need this information right now. Maybe one day when you're de developing libraries instead of uh, or frameworks instead of applications, you will use these concepts. But for now, new function syntax is not really that important. I don't know if there are exercises about scheduling. There are, and there's just two. So before doing function composition, maybe we can do this one. Or you know what, no, I'll do function composition because I'm afraid that it will take 45 minutes to, to tell you about function composition if I want to take it slow. So yeah, this is actually a new topic, but it's a topic that is completely optional. That's why I'm doing this in the Easter special and not in our usual lessons of the academy. This is just because Bobby is really, really curious about function composition. And it's uh, an important task, an important topic, which you can, however, discover later on. I don't want you guys to feel overwhelmed by the difficulty of grasping this concept or the difficulty of using it. So no worries. I'm going to talk about function composition, but let's just not worry too much. Function composition is one of those concepts that I usually start talking about when I, uh, when I teach React in my paid courses. And now I'm going to give it to you for free. So we already used some functions uh, some, uh, some weeks ago, which were all about transforming a string in multiple ways for example i had a string i have a string called hello world and i want this string to become hello world or shouted and with exclamation mark and also with a tag which is an h1 you remember this exercise we did it and how did we achieve this result we achieved it by creating one function or maybe even creating multiple functions together, uh, I will rehearse the solution with multiple functions, okay? So I can create a function, maybe an arrow function, because it looks nicer, and I will call it shout. Shout, given a string, will transform the string into its uppercase counterpart. So in this case, it will be string to uppercase. And this will make it so that if I have a string like hello world, this will become hello world, all shouted. Then we want another function here. Uh, and I don't know how to call it. Uh, can we say something like exclamate? Is it a verb? Ooh, 
It is. Probably it is. Let me see this one. What does exclamates mean? mean? No. Uh, I don't want to use the uh, an improper word. Okay, maybe it's a misspelled. Probably it's not a good word. Okay, it's uh, the part past participle of exclamar, which is probably yeah, it's it's Latin, it's not English, so I cannot use exclamate. I wanted to apply an exclamation mark. <laughs> That's why uh, I was probably creating a neologism, which is exclamate. So let's say add exclamation. Add exclamation, given a string, is going to, well, concatenate the string with some exclamation marks. For example, this one here, okay? This is the function add exclamation. You can just call it add exclamation or something. Thanks, Bobby. <laughs> I didn't see your comments uh, soon enough, but apparently we, uh, we, we went to the same results. So if I have a string called hello world, this will become hello world with the exclamation mark. Okay, And then I can do something like to HTML, which given a string will... Uh, well, let's use the template literal in this case. Uh, it will use h1 and then the string interpolated in between and then the closing h1. So if I want to have an example of this, if I have hello world, then this will give me h1 with hello world in between. Okay? And then, of course, we can combine all these functions together to get the final results, which is an HTML version of an exclamated version of a shouted version of Hello World. So if I want to do everything at the same time, I can take my Hello World and I can uh, shout it like this. And then whatever is shouted can be exclamated if it's... You know, I, I want to, 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 to coin this new word, even if it's not English. I don't care. I'm, I'm not English. I'm, I'm Italian, so I can do it. Uh, add exclamation. And then to HTML. You see, we are creating this uh, Russian doll, this matrioska of uh, function invocations that will ultimately probably do what we want. So I'm also going to do console log it and see if it does what we want. This is some code that works, which doesn't mean that it's code that you should write. In fact, this is really ugly code. Node function composition. Yep, it says hello world the way I wanted. But this code is a nightmare. What if I want to exclamate before uh, shouting? Well, in this case, I would have to take this function name and place it here. And re well, you have to switch places. Or I can try to do something like this. I can put some uh, indentation here, which allows me to also better understand what is the flow of things. And maybe I can try to, yeah, uh, invert the order of these two. So now I'm adding exclamation to something that was already turned into HTML. I probably should also put some uh, indentation in here too. So in this case, I can add the exclamation right before shouting. But look how ugly this code is. This looks like Hadouken code, right? You remember Hadouken code? This is something that we really, really don't want to have. Hadouken code is code that looks like this, like uh, Ryu or Ken performed a Hadouken on it. And it usually is some uh, if-else cascade. But not always. Sometimes it's just uh, multiple function invocations nested one inside of the other. Sometimes it's uh, callback hell, which we haven't uh, discovered yet, but we will do next Saturday, probably. So, we don't like this Hadouken code. Is there a better way <clears throat> to define this uh, flow of uh, transformations on the string in a more flat way, in a flatter way? Uh, yes, there is. One thing that we tried already together was something like this. We can have uh, 
let str is equal to hello world and then we can just reuse this variable as the result of another computation so str is hello world well no str is now the shouted version of the string itself no string is also the add exclamation version of the string itself yeah but string is also the uh, to HTML version of that string and finally I can console log the string and hopefully this will give me exactly the same results is this true let me see yep still doing hello world this is already nice uh, it's nice and it's also it's flat it's very easy to uh, change the order in which you uh, invoke these functions you can even comment them out pretty easily while here it was pretty difficult to comment out something for example add exclamation you had to comment out this but also the closing parentheses right so it was a little more difficult here so yeah this is already better the one thing that I really don't like about this is, well, two things. First of all, the order in which I see the function invocations is exactly the opposite of how I see them here. And it's exactly the opposite of how I see the final result. If I read this thing too fast, I would say that I'm shouting an add exclamation of to, etch it, uh, to HTML of the string. But it's actually the opposite. Uh, this is the to HTML of add exclamation of shout of hello world. So I would have to read it from the bottom to the top to really understand what is happening here. So maybe we can use function composition. Function composition uh, is the concept of using a mathematical concept in the programming world. The mathematical concept is called, well, function composition. And it's usually written like this. Um, if you have two functions, f and g, you compose them with the compose operator, which usually looks like a small o. So it's f o g. Or maybe you can use the degree. Nah, no, it's more similar to an o. And the composition of these functions, if applied to x, is equal to doing f of g of x. I really hope I'm not messing up with the order. Sometimes I just uh, forget that it's uh, actually g of f instead of f of g. But I think it's like this. Uh, let me check. Function, composition. So, wait a second. g composed to f. Uh, applied to x is g of f of x. So since I have f of g, uh, composed to g, uh, this is actually right. It's exactly like this. So, okay. So the definition, the mathematical formal definition of this is f o g, f composed to g. And it doesn't look very useful, very interesting. Also, we cannot define new operators on JavaScript. So we cannot define an operator called o. So we cannot even use it like this. We will use it in another way. We will create another uh, function called compose. And compose will take two functions, f and g. And compose is a curried function because it's a function that returns a function. And the function can be applied to x. And the result of composing f and g and then uh, applying the composition of f and g to x is exactly the same as invoking the matrioska, the Russian doll of functions to x. So this is what we are going to do right now. We're going to create a function called compose, which takes any number of functions and applies them in order to x. And compose, as you can see, is a curried function. It's a higher order function because it's a function that returns a function. Actually, this is a function that takes as parameters other functions and then returns a function that I can apply to x. Okay? So, how do I implement this compose function? 
the solution is pretty simple because it's just one line of code if I want to, but it's, as you know, simple does not mean easy. In fact, it's usually the opposite. Simple things are very hard to achieve and complex things are very easy to achieve. So in order to have this thing to be simple, we have to think pretty hard on how it works. Compose needs some functions. I will call them FNS functions. And if you see how I declared the, uh, the way I use Compose, it's actually functions uh, just spread as parameters, as multiple parameters. So if you remember, there's the spread operator, the rest parameter operator, which allows you to get all the parameters of function and to store them in an array, an array called FNS in this case. So this already addresses the problem of uh, having the compose function rely on multiple different uh, parameters. Uh, now, I've got these, for, uh, these functions and I want to apply all these functions to my X. And what is X? Well, compose as a function will have to return a function that is depending on X. So we already said that this is a higher order function and we have to make this higher order function return a function that depends on X. Okay, now the signature is exactly the same. This compose function is a function that takes multiple functions and returns a function that depends on X. So if I try to invoke compose of F G to X, well, at least it doesn't give me a syntax error. It doesn't do what I want, but at least the syntax is correct here. So how do I apply all those functions in order to X? It's actually not that difficult if you remember that there is an array method that allows you to accumulate a partial result. And at the end of the iterations, at the end of the loop, it will give you the final result. The method that I'm talking about is called reduce and it's a method that arrays have. So I can say fns.reduce. And the curious thing about the reduce method in this particular case is that the reduce function, we, all, we always saw it as um, a function that allows me to sum numbers. For example, you start with an initial value uh, with that initial number, usually zero, and then you accumulate all the numbers that you find in the array and finally you get the final sum of all the numbers. But as I already told you, the reduce function can be used on any kind of accumulator. The accumulator can be maybe, um, well, it can be uh, an object, it can be an array, it can be a number, a string that you want to concatenate, it can even be a function if you want to. In this case, we can start with the number x as the initial value of the, uh, of the reduce function. If I don't have any functions at all, then composing no functions and applying them to x will just give me x as it is, unchanged. But if I do have some functions, then I can write an accumulator function here, uh, not an, uh, sorry, not an accumulator function, uh, just a callback function that uses the current accumulator and the current function because I'm iterating over an array of functions. And at the end, of course, I will return whatever is the result of the reduce function. So the accumulator at first is X. And if I don't have any functions, I'll just return X as it is. But if there is a function, then I want the new value of the accumulator to be whatever is the results of applying the current function to the current value of the accumulator. And then I'm just going to return the new value of the accumulator. So I can just return function of accumulator. So let me try to unwrap what is happening here. If I do have F and G, maybe also H, Let's do compose of F, G and H on X. What happens in this case? 
Well, I have an array of f, g, and h, and I'm going to reduce them starting from x, right? So at first, the accumulator is x, and the first item that I find is f. So what happens here is that the accumulator will be f of x. This is exactly what we did here. So the current value of the accumulator is f of x. Then the array now has processed f, so we've got g and h. g and h will reduce the same way. Uh, right now the current value of the accumulator is not x anymore, it's f of x. We can call it like this. The current value of, uh, the, of the accumulator is f of x. And now that we have f of x as the current value of the accumulator, the next value that we want to process is g. And so what we return here is g of f of x, because we are just wrapping f of x with the current function, that is g. The next iteration, I don't know if this works for you, I'm writing some sort of pseudocode. The next iteration will reduce the remaining x, the current value was g of f of x, and the current function that we are processing is the h function. So in this case, we are just returning h of g of f of x. And we ran out of items in the array, so the final result will be h of g of f of x. This is the result of composing f of g of h applied to x. We just need a reduce and we've got this result. But there's a problem with this result. This result is exactly the opposite of what I wanted. I didn't want h of g of f, I wanted f of g of h. So the only problem that's left to solve here, if this, thing's really, if this thing really works, is to iterate over the array of functions, but starting from the, the, the end of the array. So I can try to reverse the array before doing the reduce, or I can use another array method that I barely mentioned, which is called reduce write. Reduce right is exactly the same as reduce, but starts from the right, from the bottom of the array to the top. And this is how you reverse the, uh, the way that you process these functions. So in the end, you will have f of g of h of x. And if this function seems complicated, because it's a function that returns a function, that returns some, the invocation of a function on some other uh, callback function. Well, now we can even clean it up and you will see that this is just a one-liner. In fact, reduce write is taking this callback function, but this callback function is an arrow function that does one thing, that one thing is returning the result of an expression. So it means that I can remove the curly braces and we're left with just one line. This return reduce writes is the result of returning this anonymous function. The anonymous function is the result of composing all the functions applied to x. This is also a function that only does one thing, so we can remove the curly braces and the return statement. And now what we are left with is the compose function, which is this higher order function that given the array of functions will return this function here. It does one thing. So we can remove the curly braces and the return statement, and this is the compose function. So I can just remove everything that is on top of here because it's not really that useful. This is the implementation of the compose function. Nothing more than that. Will it work? Let's find out. But I hope that it's, it, you can understand how it's just uh, an application of using the reduce array method in a special way, because we are now accumulating a result, which maybe is a number, maybe is a string. I don't even know what is x. And in fact, we're going to use it as a string because the initial value of this hello world will be a string. But what we are doing here while accumulating is 
not iterating over a, a, new, a number, not iterating over a string, but iterating over a function and applying this function on the current value of the accumulator. This is the only very complex thing that is about the compose function. But if you did your homework well in the previous weeks, uh, trying to really, really understand how the reduce function works, this should not be really that tricky to you. Probably it is, because here we're also mixing some curring. But I hope it's not really that, that difficult. Now that we've got the compose function, we can even rewrite this thing here as compose of, well, we want to compose three functions. One function is shout, one is add exclamation, and one is to HTML. And we want to compose them actually by doing first, well, to HTML of add exclamation of shout. So I'm going to just list all the functions that I want to apply in the order in which I want to apply them. Yeah, as usual, the tricky part is coming up with the solution. Yeah, of course. So I'm going to just state all the functions that I want to apply to X, to the string, one by one. One, two, and three. These are all the functions that I want to then apply to X, which is my string. Or I can just say hello world. And what happens if I console log this thing? I probably need to also comment out this part. Otherwise, it's getting in our way. And I have exactly the same result. Hello world. All shouted with exclamation marks and with the tag called h1. Uh, I don't really like it seen like this um, because it's much better to have them indented. If you have them indented, it's even more clear how nice it is to have the compose function. The compose function, as you can see, is very similar to writing the, the, the invocations in, in this way, but now you've got all this function uh, listed in the correct order. Also, these functions are now hard-coded in this scenario. But in here, you can even, uh, you know, you can give those functions from outside. Nobody told you that these functions should be exactly these ones. You can also get them from outside. You can even ask the user, hey, what should I do with my hello world? The user will input, uh, do a to HTML, then do an exclamation, then do a shout, and then you can spread all the function names in here uh, all the function reference in here and you will have uh, this compose function be applied to hello world and this all thanks to the reduce array method and due to currying because currying allows me to create this compose function and then apply all those functions at the same time to the to the current uh, input and currying as always allows you also to cache things so, for example, I can say const create a shouted title. Create a shouted title is a function that I want to shout the string and add exclamation marks and also put it in a, a title tag, an h1 tag. How do I write such a function? Well, I can just compose those functions together. And here it is. My new function is just the result of composing other functions. Then, if I want to, I can reuse that function for hello world. And I can reuse the same function for something else. Um, happy Easter. If I do this, now I'm using the same function, which is the result of combining multiple functions together with two inputs. So as you can see, with function composition, you really have the power of uh, functions working as Lego building blocks that you can compose together and mix them together in ways 
that you can expect or even in unexpected ways. Maybe one day you'll come up with a, a new way to arrange those building blocks together. But that's not it all. That's not over. Uh, we can make things even more complicated now. For example, who said that the exclamation mark is an exclamation mark like this one? Uh, maybe I want three exclamation marks. Maybe I want a question mark instead, because, because why not? Um, I don't know. I want to make it a little uh, different. So maybe I can say that this add exclamation is a function that takes two parameters, the string and also the exclamation mark that I want to uh, concatenate to the initial string. So this will be exclamation string plus whatever exclamation I have. And the same goes with two HTML. Who said that I have to create an H1? Maybe I want to create a paragraph. So I can say to HTML is a function that takes a string and also take the tag name or the tag. And I'm going to also interpolate the tag name, not only the string, because I want the tag to be generic, to be parametric. However, this thing is not going to work. It's going to actually break my code. Why is it going to break my code? Well, let's reason again about this uh, composition. Composition takes all these functions and applies them one by one to my input, to my only input. The functions take only one input at a time. And instead, now we've got functions that take two parameters. So probably these exclamation and this two HTML will apply to the current string, but will completely ignore the second parameter that I just put. So yeah, this is probably going to break. Undefined, hello world undefined, undefined. Why is that? Well, because I'm using a second parameter, which is undefined. So that's why we are looking at undefined as exclamation and undefined as a tag. So if I want these functions to be more parametric, but still to be able to be composed, I have to do something else. And what do I have to do? Well, I need to curry. Again, I need to use some currying. I can transform this add exclamation function to a function that takes the exclamation. And once you get the exclamation, you return a function that given the string will now give you the string plus the exclamation. And the same goes with 2HTML. 2HTML can become a function that takes the tag and will not just return the string, it will return a function that, given the string, will combine the tag and the string together. This way, I can now create other functions like uh, const add single exclamation. Add single exclamation is the results of using add exclamation by stating that the exclamation mark should be only one exclamation mark. But I can also have a triple exclamation, which is the result of doing add exclamation, but with three question marks, three, not two. What is this add exclamation one, que one exclamation mark? Well, add exclamation now is a curified function. So it's a function that given the exclamation mark is giving me a function that has the same signature as before. It takes only one parameter which is exactly what the compose function needed a while ago. And the same goes with 2HTML. 2HTML, uh, we can create uh, two functions, for example, uh, like uh, 2H1. 2H1 is the result of uh, invoking 2HTML, but specifying H1 as the tag. And the same goes with 2P. 2P is, you know what, I'm going to call them 2Title and 2Paragraph. Two paragraph is the result of invoking two HTML, but keeping aside the fact that the tag should be a paragraph. And now two title and two paragraph are two functions that are have this shape here. They are functions that take a string and will return the modified string, which is exactly the same shape that we used to have for the compose function. So it's actually exactly what we wanted. 
So now instead of two HTML, we can use to title, which is the two HTML, but with H1 as a tag. And the same goes with add exclamation. We can then use add triple exclamation, which is the result of adding exclamation, but with triple, triple uh, exclamation marks. Shout, we didn't change it. Shout was a function of one parameter. So it stays like this. And now that we have a create a shouted title, let's call it create shouted title. Uh, this can be used for hello world, but we can also create another function, create a uh, shouted paragraph, which is the results of composing maybe two paragraph with add single exclamation and with also the shout. And I'm going to use it here for a happy Easter. And if I now execute all this, I will see that hello world has triple exclamation marks and it's H1 and happy Easter is one exclamation mark and it's P. Or maybe I don't want to even shout the paragraph, so I'm going to remove the shout function. And now the happy Easter is not even shouted. Maybe I want it to be capitalized. I can create a capitalized function and I can compose it in here. So now we've got compose as a curryfied function, as a curried function, because it takes multiple functions and given a second parameter, which is the X, will actually compose all the functions. But now we also got the curryfied functions that we are composing into. And I place them as separate functions that I can reuse. But of course, I can now place them exactly where they should be used if I don't need to use them anymore. So if I'm just using them once, I can just write them like this. Our same goes with two title. Okay, so I'm, I'm not forced to create all these variables if I don't want to. The important part about, the, the very difficult part about curring, I think, is that uh, it's pretty strange to see how some functions are just uh, used as references to those functions and instead some other functions are used as invocations of functions. Why is it so? Well, because shout is a function, so I need to pass a reference to that function, but add exclamation or to HTML are functions that return functions. These are curried functions. So I want to start already passing the first parameter, so I will be left with a function that takes the string as what the parameter and has the same signature as this function here. So this is the tricky part, probably. And I always try to add some uh, extra indentation here, but it's not possible to keep it un unless I trick Prettier with some extra comments. So here we are. Create shouted title is a function that it's a completely new function. And it's uh, it it doesn't have any any algorithms. It's just the result of composing functions together. And the same goes with create shouted paragraph. I'm just reusing the same functions that I declared before, but now I'm creating some more generic parametric functions that can behave in multiple ways that can be combined also in multiple ways uh, in different build as different building blocks it's quite complicated and you don't need to know it immediately by heart i don't think there will be an interview especially for a junior position they in which they ask you about function composition but still, this is a superpower that I'm giving to you. And don't worry if you don't grasp it right now. It will be much easier when you use it on a real life case. For example, I used it quite a lot when building React applications. Not because I'm forced to use uh, curring, but curring is actually uh, more performant. Why is it performant? Because when you do curring, you can use the first parameter, maybe even do calculations on the first parameter, and then somehow you cache this initial calculation somewhere and you can apply the cached calculation 
to other uh, parameters later on which is similar to what we already said about the memoized function right the memoized function was a way to create a cache that caches stores all the partial calculations that can be reapplied to any uh, any new parameter and that's it this is function composition whenever you see something like the pipe function in rxjs and i.e I, I don't really like uh, RxJS, but I understand why some people like it. But if you see RxJS, RxJS is heavily based on some functional uh, programming concepts. In fact, look at this, uh, at, at this uh, paragraph. Pipeable operators are functions, so they could be used like ordinary functions. For example, operator in two obs. But in practice, there tend to be many of them convolved together and quickly become unreadable. You would have something like op4 of op3 of op2 of op1 of obs. For that reason, observables, the concept that RxJS gives to you, have a method called pipe that accomplishes the same thing while being much easier to read. In fact, you can ask the obs to pipe all these operators together. And as you can see, the operators have a couple of parentheses, which means that though these operators are curried, just like the operators, just like the functions that we declared here. Okay, so it's just this. Piping and composing is exactly the same thing. And it's all about, uh, it's, it's more of a sugar syntax. You don't need to create the Russian doll. You don't need to create the Matryoshka of all the functions that invoke the other functions, you can just place them nicely one next to the other and then apply them all together to your input. And this allows for a, a lot of composition, right? And the same goes with uh, other composing libraries. So I already told you that Redux has the compose function. Uh, the compose function in Redux has exactly the same meaning. Compose, given a list of all the functions, will create a new function that you are able then to apply to some other, uh, to some other input. Um, well, this is uh, applied to a very special case, but it's a composed of apply middleware thunk, which apparently is a curried function, a curried function, and then also DevTools instrument, which is also a curried function. This returns a function that will be applied to something else. You don't see where it is applied, and you didn't even need to care about where it is applied. But if you look at the source code of the compose function, it will probably be similar to what we made maybe it will be much, much more complicated because in libraries, you usually have also uh, some, uh, you know, input parsing, input validation, and some special cases and some special scenarios that pertain the specific library that you're using. But maybe we can, maybe we can find it here. I don't know, in the source folder, compose, it's in TypeScript. And we've got all these type definitions that we don't really care about. Uh, yep, here is the compose function. So the compose function, as you can see, is like this. If the length of the array of functions is zero, then return a function that just gives you the argument itself. Uh, this is not JavaScript, this is TypeScript. So it's JavaScript with the addition of uh, static typing which is not really that readable to me and probably not readable to you too because this is static typing, this is uh, a generic, if I remember correctly. Uh, I, I hate this kind of code, but I, I know that many people prefer it to plain JavaScript. Uh, let's just uh, try to remove in our head those things that we don't care about. So for example, this, or we can do the exercise ourselves. We can just copy this, I can place it here and I can just remove whatever is typing. This is typing, this is typing, and what else? Okay, this is also, 
and I don't really care about export default. I never told you about this. So compose function in plain JavaScript looks like this. Funks.length is equal to zero. Return a function that given the argument is going to return the argument itself, which I don't know if it's really that useful. In fact, I think that our compose function is already able to tackle this problem. If the array of functions is empty, then reduce write will just give you the initial value of x. So we don't really need that if. I think so. And if the functions, uh, if the length of the function is one, then it's just going to apply the first function. Okay, but why? Why should I, uh, I? I don't understand why should I really use this this thing here. And then here's the reduce function. The reduce taken given a, which is the accumulator, and b, which is the current function is going to apply the accumulator on the current function. So this is not exactly as my reduce writes, but it probably is exactly the same because here it's applying the accumulator on the function. Well, here I'm using the function on the accumulator, but as you can imagine, it's exactly the same. And it's slightly different because it's using multiple arguments in here. Instead, I'm using only one argument. Actually, I'm not even using an argument. So, okay, it's a slightly different implementation, but it's very, very similar, as you can see. So this is the compose function. Bobby says, you say that we don't need it for junior position, but you never know. Nowadays, people want you to implement Dijkstra from scratch before you're asked to center a div or change background color on the real job they offer. My personal experience is that I was asked to do some complex algorithms, maybe even on a blackboard, maybe even not on a computer, and for a position of, uh, I don't know, tech leader, which has nothing to do with complex algorithms. But this is just because I am graduated, I've got a degree, I've got a master's degree, and they expect a lot from me. And usually those companies are big companies like Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, etc. Or they are stupid companies that want to behave like the big players and they feel cool in doing these very difficult uh, tech uh, interviews. But in my current experience, what I saw is that the market outside uh, out there is huge and you can easily find a job in the IT market. Even if you're shitty, I can assure you that even if you're a crap developer, even if you're self-taught, even if you have no experience whatsoever, as long as you are young enough, because if you're 40 or 50, that's already problematic, uh, at least in Italy. But if you're young and you don't even need to be talented, there's such a shortage of developers out there that you will find a job there. And if... Uh, so this is why if you ha if you have a technical interview that is so complicated that they ask you for the compose function, even if you are uh, applying for a junior position and you're self-taught and you don't have a master's degree, etc., etc., then just tell them, screw you guys, I'm going to to go to another company. I don't care. You really you are uh, you are in the, you have the higher ground. Okay, those companies have only. Uh, to lose from this and they are starting probably to learn it i remember when i spoke with facebook they told me that their uh, their screening uh, with technical interviews was uh, was actually creating too many false positives too many people that were very talented but were discarded by this stupid kind of uh, technical interview and they were regretting this so i don't know if the technical interview for Facebook is now easier. Maybe yes, maybe not. I don't really care because I don't want to work for Facebook anymore currently. Uh, but still, nowadays companies are still trying to do a thorough screening. So they will probably do uh, six or 12 interviews uh, trying to understand you from every single point of view. But those are still the big companies. Small companies usually, smaller companies, not small companies, smaller companies than Facebook usually are not that demanding. So just focus on enjoying yourself, learning stuff and uh, creating your portfolio, playing around, creating your own pet projects, your own toy projects 
and learning from them. And this is what I want to do as soon as I finish the academy. I want to show you uh, some uh, cool libraries, some cool frameworks that you can even learn by yourselves if you want to. And we can share information and knowledge together. And you can easily create uh, even complex projects with those few things. Uh, so hopefully you will have success in the IT field, even discarding those stupid advanced uh, technical interviews. Don't worry about that. And that's it for today because it's 14.04 my time. So I want to wish you a happy Easter. And especially remember to eat your uh, Easter eggs. Remember to eat everything you want, but especially eat pasta and code faster. Bye.